the implication. Well, I kind of laughed at it when I went in today and I had said at work, like, I have to leave early. Welcome. Oh, you gotta do it loud. Right. I'm trying. Teacher, Teacher voice is on. Okay, here we go. Welcome to the uh, Scarborough School Board workshop agenda for today, Thursday, the 17th of December. Can I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan. Here. Mrs. Giftos. Mrs. Glidden. Here. Mr. Gill. Yes. Ms. Casalonis. Here. Ms. Layton. Here. Mrs. Scyther. Here. Mr. Hinton. Here. Ms. Caldwell. Here. Can you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so there's a lot of people today. This is awesome. 
Um, the workshop for this afternoon is Collaborative Decision Making Processes by the Schools. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate this. This is great. Um, Beth, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, one second. Let me find the clicker. I wanted to first um, start by welcoming you all to the school board workshop and thanking all of our teachers for accompanying us tonight. Um, we apologize that we don't have better space, but there's a, another meeting happening next door. And so um, we tried to be as creative as we could with the tables, the a number of tables and chairs available to us. Um, if you are sitting around the back, you know, you want to scooch in, feel free. If you want to speak at any time, we can also use the mic on the podium. Um, we do like to talk into the mic so that folks at home can hear us. Um, and also then when it's um, available on demand on the town website, folks can watch it back if they would like. Um, with that being said, I'll go ahead and get us started because we have a pretty tight agenda this evening. Um, it always sounds like, you know, I'm going to a two-hour workshop, that's a lot of time, but we never, ever, ever have trouble, no matter how much time we have, filling it right up, and tonight will not be any different. So our objective tonight is to review the decision-making processes that currently exist um, at each phase level, department, and a bit at the district level, uh, in order to orient our new school board to the various opportunities that staff in Scarborough have to provide input, feedback, um, and assist with our decision-making processes. And one of the things I was sharing with our new board members is that um, each building really has um, specific ways that they engage staff in those, um, in those ways. And so rather than me telling them about it, we really wanted to have some teacher leaders um, and folks that are in formal and informal leadership positions here to talk directly to the board because one of the um, many great things about our new board is that they really want to hear directly from, from staff. And so that's a really, um, ex this, this should be a really exciting opportunity for us to get started with that. And as you know, I always like to get us started by reminding us of our mission and our vision and our values. So here is the mission that we've been working off from for the past couple of years. Um, and when we think about our mission, you'll all remember back to opening day, how I would show the table analogy. Um, but the mission is one of the four legs to our table and that this helps create the foundation that all of our work rests upon. And so I'll just go ahead and read this for us to orient us and get us focused. Um, the fundamental purpose of the Scarborough Public Schools is to provide safe and inclusive learning environment where each and every student is empowered to be a resilient lifelong learner who is prepared to engage as a contributing member of society. And so really at the heart of our work, of course, um, are our students. And we always try to take a student-centered or learner-centered approach as we strive toward the type of school district we hope to become. And this doesn't mean that we aren't satisfied or happy or proud of the things that we're doing currently. It just means that we are committed to ensuring continuous improvement for our students um, all the time. And so our, our vision is actually a more um, lengthy document than what you see here on this slide, but we've organized it into these four strategic themes um, that I think we could all agree will lead to ensuring that we're continuously improving. And so that's staying, keeping focused on uh, effective teaching and learning and what that looks like, safe and inclusive schools for all of our students, global citizenship, how are we preparing our students for the world that they're going to enter into and are engaging in, and then community engagement. How do we engage our community um, both within our organization and outside our organization so that we can secure the types of resources that we need in order to deliver on our promise to our students, which is to ensure that um, they are ready to be contributing members of society. And then our values. So we have this mission. It's why we exist. That's one leg. We have our vision. Who are we trying to become? And then we have our values. So how are we going to behave or what are our collective commitments in order to realize that mission and vision? And so in Scarborough, we have come up with this core values statement, which is that the Scarborough Public Schools are committed to all students becoming college, career, and civic ready through student-centered learning. Um, we believe that decisions in planning, instruction, and continuous improvement of our schools must be made with the students' individual needs and interests as our primary consideration. <coughs> and then again, that's part of a larger document that outlines what are those collective commitments, and it's broken down by um, 
what we believe our students need to be committed to, our staff, our community, our essential operations, our leaders, and our parents. Oh, this didn't refresh, hold on. Watch the course. making those decisions and planning with the students at the center of every single decision, we believe in Scarborough that our decisions must be made collaboratively. And we also believe in a shared decision-making structure when possible and appropriate. Um, so that means that most of our decisions, we have the time um, to engage our staff or our community, both our students, um, in that decision-making process. And sometimes this can be frustrating for folks because it's, it can feel like it slows things down or that maybe decisions aren't being made as quickly as they would like, and that can be a good thing and a frustrating thing. Um, some of the, sh the strategies for success in, in a truly collaborative shared de decision-making structure is that you involve stakeholders from the beginning. And so what we have learned um, in the recent past is that when you engage people after decisions have already been made or after you're far down along the, the, the process of making a decision, it doesn't tend to turn out very well. And so we want to strive towards involving stakeholders from the beginning, right from the moment we have a question and a wonder about something that can improve outcomes for our kids. And then take the time in that shared decision-making structure, whether it be a meeting or a forum, um, to really take time to build trust. And again, this is, the, sometimes people are frustrated by this. This is usually like the norm setting part of um, a committee coming together or, and really <coughs> trying to identify what your shared purpose is, but it's essential that we take that time to do that. Using a neutral facilitator, this isn't always something that we have access to. But increasingly, we've been thinking about how do we um, bring in an outside facilitator to help us, when, especially when we're trying to truly have shared um, voice in a decision. And so one recent example of that would be this summer with our professional development redesign. That was a K-12 um, committee. I think there was 36 of us all together, and we had an outside facilitator um, for that work. And being honest. Um, and that means being honest with ourselves about the work that needs to be done, being honest with ourselves about the readiness of our community or our staff um, to be able to make the, you know, to actually implement whatever the decision might be, and being patient. And so um, you've probably heard me say more times than once, you know, people often say that change is hard. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I think change is the actual easy part. We can change things in a minute. It's improvement that I think is really the part um, that takes deep commitment and patience. And so giving ourselves a chance to really truly engage in that plan, do, study, act cycle of improvement is essential, no matter how small or big the decision is. And so what I would like to do to get us started, I'm gonna turn it over to the high school first, and they're gonna talk about kind of the who, what, how of decision making at the high school, and then we will talk with the middle school and work our way through each of the phase levels, Wentworth um, and the K2s. And the, our teachers are here because we wanna hear your voices. So I know you've talked with your principals and you've worked to put your slides together, but please feel free to step up to the, the circle here or to the podium so that um, if you have an idea or something you wanna share, you can. Looking at the amount of content we have to cover and the amount of time we have, um, I would ask two things. One, that each phase level try to share broadly um, sort of how decisions are made at your building um, in about 10 to 15 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes or so, and that the board just jot notes as we go. So that way we can get through and hear from each phase level. And then Monique's also gonna talk a bit about district decisions uh, how district decisions are made. And then we'll do questions and kind of just do an open dialogue at the end. And if we need more time, we can always schedule more time. This is really just meant to whet your appetite and give you a little sneak peek inside what's happening at the schools. So with that, I turn it over to Sue Ketch. Sorry, Julie, will this presentation slide, slides be available online? Yes, they are. We always post the presentations with the workshop um, minutes. So, Principal Ketch. <laughs> so, this is um, uh, just an overview of the school and 
Um, basically, it's broken up by departments, which we work a lot in the department <coughs> mode. And um, time out, sorry. Can I ask you to go to the podium? Because our table mics are really an either or. If we turn them on, we'll see um, overhead amplification. Your ears will all bleed. bleed. Do we have a wireless mic that could be passed around? Maybe. Oh, let's do that. Sue, would you prefer a wireless? I'll get started over here while we're slow down. We don't want any bleeding ears. Am I close enough? Yes. 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 Okay. So this, as you can tell, we are a very large building with many departments and many supports, but just um, if you can't quite read it too well, it's like the first line is English department, the lead teacher department head, and then the number of teachers under. And so that is just basically how we are organized. Um, can we go to the next slide? So for us, for large, large building-wide topics or um, educational decisions, we really um, have been using for quite a few years now, I'd say probably about six, we've been using what we call the cycle of decision making. So it often begins with the building leadership team, the BLT, and we're looking at a growth opportunity or a, just a, something that we feel we need to improve on and in sort of a building-wide way. And so that rolls immediately out to the instructional leadership <coughs> team, department heads, um, in that meeting. And we roll out um, what the opportunity is or where we feel we need to have some improvement. We discuss it at the ILT meeting, and often we plan our strategy for um, sharing that in department meetings. <coughs> so one of the things we learned about our building um, as we explored this whole cycle of decision making was that we felt we're such a large school that if there were ways for us to um, have smaller discussions, smaller group discussions, we felt we would hear the voice of, of the school better. And so first, um, from the ILT, it moves to departments, and we have small group discussions with with um, subject alike groups. So like the English department will have this discussion and make their recommendations and share their thoughts. Um, and then the next step is to move it to the full faculty meeting. And again, we break into small groups, but we do that with members from each department in a small group so that first they've thought about it in their own subject matter. And then the next conversation broadens a little bit where they take into account the thoughts and ideas of a department different from theirs that may look at it a little bit differently. And we feel that that really helps to um, improve our thinking and our decision because we've just broadened the, the uh, approach for that. Once we've um, done both of those meetings and collected our discussions and recommendations and ideas, it rolls back to the ILT again um, to have some final discussions and recommendations. And I, I can say that there have been times when it's had to go through that process even more than once because as we worked, we thought we need to go back and, and work on this a little bit harder and make sure we've rediscussed it with departments and full faculties. And then ultimately, um, the final decision is made with the recommendation from the ILT, but that is generally made um, at the BLT level as, you know, as the final dotting the I's and crossing the T's. And then we often go through the plan, do, study, act cycle and um, make changes again as we grow and learn. So if we go to the next slide. Principal Ketch, before we go to the next slide, could you introduce who from your team is here today? Oh, sure. Gregory Appelstein, Assistant Principal, Ed Buckley, Assistant Principal, Mike Legage, Athletic Director and Director of Activities, Albert McCormack, Department Head for Science, and Eric Zavasnik, Department Head for World Languages. And then I see Christie's here as well as a teacher. Any other high school staff here? Okay, that's it. All right, thank you. Um, and then, so then we also just put up some um, examples of our collaborative decision making. And um, so we included, as we 
built um, the advisory and A East program, the program that meets 35 minutes every morning for students to be able to tag a teacher and get extra help, and the advisory program, which is um, a small group, and they have that advisor for four years as much as we are able to, um, to do that. Just another caring adult that kids can work with. As we developed that program and there were committees that worked on that, um, that went through the decision-making cycle to keep everybody informed of that work. As we moved toward a block schedule, that was something that went through this cycle. Um, the NIAS self-study, we broke into the standards, the seven standards, and did our work. And as people completed that work, the report went to the department to look at and talk about in their group, and then it moved to faculty. And of course, as part of the NIAS process, it had to be voted on by the faculty. But again, we ran it through that cycle to make sure people um, had a chance to reflect and talk about that. Um, as we worked on the later start benefits and challenges, um, that, that work went through this. This fall, the grading and reporting work um, has gone through this cycle, and, and I would say almost in an expanded way, because we also did surveys with the parents and the students, so even collecting our data, I would almost call it a blown up um, cycle of decision making for that work this fall. And um, the evolution, evolution of our midterm exams um, went through this cycle at times. We used to um, start exams on the Friday before Martin Luther King, and then there was some, some discussion about maybe it would be better to start at the end of a three-day weekend, giving those kids that study break. And so that work and evolution um, has gone through this cycle of decision-making as well. Would any of our teachers or um, other leaders at the high school want to add to what Sue has shared? Not yet? Okay. All right. So we will transition now to the middle school, and I'll ask Diane if you could um, have your teachers introduce themselves as well. So I'm Diane, and I'm the principal. Oh, Dave It's a motor break. I'm Diane Neto, I'm the principal. Dave Currier, assistant principal. Heather Labby, lead teacher. Jill or Claire. <laughs> <laughs> Sixth six grade lead teacher. Let me correct. Heather Mazur, <laughs> recently <laughs> <been> married. <laughs> Habit. Correct the record. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's always interesting when we have a big group presentation because I think all of us come to the work um, through our own lens and so as we started thinking about our middle school presentation tonight um, we really designed it so that you're going to hear more from the teachers than you're going to hear from me um, so again I think that's just um, the way in which we all take a look at the work so I'll just get us started off by sharing with you the middle school team configuration. So um, we're organized a little bit differently. Um, if you take a look at the schematic that's in front of you, um, you'll see that there are different colored blocks. And those represent um, folks who are on our instructional leadership team. And so unlike the high school that's department focused or subject area focused, at the middle school, we're organized by um, having grade level um, leaders and then having um, a leader of teaching and learning, which is really um, nested some of our encore teachers or our instructional support teachers. We have um, Heather, who serves as our encore um, lead teacher. Uh, we have support services um, and then special services. So what we've done is we've organized our team around the different lenses from which people come at the work at the middle school. And then each of those groups meets independently um, from our group. But I will let Heather and Jill talk more about that. So now that I have a handle on who I am. <laughs> 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 so, 
So as Diane said, we have a much different structure than the high school. Um, we have an instructional leadership team, which Jill and I are part of. Um, I'm lead teacher of the Encore team. Um, Jill is lead teacher of the sixth grade learning community. Um, that's all the sixth grade teachers. But then within the sixth grade, there are three smaller inquiry teams where those teachers work together. Um, and they teach a group of students. And um, so our, our leadership is, team is pretty well represented. We have um, Jake Brown, who's also liaison to athletics. Um, you know, we have student advocacy represented. And we meet every week, every Wednesday. Um, the inquiry leads come once a month. Um, so they meet with their teams every week. Um, and then they are at one of the lead teacher meetings, like I said, once a month. And so what we've really done this year, um, or just actually just recently after discussing, OK, how can we best use that time with the inquiry team leads? Um, we've kind of structured those team meetings when they're there so that you know, we have the most amount of input possible from all the different teams. Because it does, I mean, what affects the sixth graders definitely affects the eighth graders differently or not at all. And same thing between the Encore and some of the core teams. Um, so we, you know, as it says, our job is to identify kind of larger school needs um, set school goals. Um, we, we do both take feedback or take information back to our teams. A lot of times it requires getting feedback and then bringing, up, bringing it back to the next meeting. Um, so a lot of our decisions that are made, and I heard Julie mention it earlier, aren't necessarily they don't happen right away because it's brought to the leadership team. We bring it back to the teams. We talk. We get feedback. Sometimes that takes a week, sometimes two, and then come back and make a final decision. Um, the inquiry teams, again, you know, they're more, um, it's a smaller group, so sometimes those are kind of easier for like the immediate pulse on what their small team of students needs and that could be it's either three classrooms of sixth graders or well or any of them or four so each inquiry team is made up of four basically classrooms of students so it really is kind of an, an intimate look into what that team needs um, and then any challenges or recommendations that come up, they can be brought to the, um, uh, the, the team lead, and they can also bring it to their inquiry lead, who, again, comes and kind of moves up the ladder. Um, the content area teams meet on a regular basis. I mean, we meet every rotation. So we have a four-day rotation. So we have a content meeting with our team. So for example, I'm on the wellness team. There are four teachers. And we meet every you know, one day of the four-day rotation to work on specific content work. Um, we have student support teams, academic intervention, social emotional intervention team, school refusal team. And all of those are geared towards you know, helping students directly and what supports do they need and you know what needs to be changed what recommendations need to be made so. Heather could you share briefly how the agenda is set for your ILT meetings so for well I'll speak for mine we have the um, you mean like the school leadership yeah the school leadership leadership team, team. okay yeah. Yep, we have an agenda set. It comes out before the meeting, so we have a chance to go over it. And then um, what we do is, you know, we go through the process. We have a facilitator, we have a timekeeper, we have a note taker, and usually, I would say 98% of the time, pretty good about going back and just reviewing a decision as we're typing it and making sure that everyone's on the same page. And then, for example, I will set my own agenda for my team you know, based on the lead 
team information or what came out of that and any questions and any feedback that's needed. And it's a shared agenda, mm -hmm. so anyone can put mm -hmm. agenda items on. Mm -hmm. So as I'm putting the agenda get together, there may be some things that we're looking at over time that are coming back, but on a week-to-week -week basis, because we do meet every Wednesday after school, um, any things that come up, people can contribute to the agenda throughout the week before the next team meeting. Yeah, all of our agendas are done, are done on a kind of a running document, and so it's the same thing with our teams. We allow all the teachers are able to put in any anything that they would like to bring up. Great, and there are times when inquiry leads might not be attending that Wednesday meeting, but because we're all on the same team, we've talked, and they'll add something and say, hey, I added this to the agenda. This is sort of what I was thinking. Can you just sort of pose it so that we can collect some feedback? Um, they don't necessarily have to wait until they attend their monthly meeting. Um, we talk very frequently in the halls, in classrooms, and have time to really meet with each other. Um, and so even if they're not necessarily at the meeting, their voice is still being heard and represented. Thank you. <laughs> so, so Jill is pinch hitting for us today yeah, because yes. the person who was supposed to come with Heather went home with conjunctivitis. Yeah. <laughs> so she's like, oh, oh. well, thank you, Jill. Yeah. You work with so these are some of the big, you know, most recent examples um, of the decision making process, you know, that's happened. The grading and reporting obviously has been a, a big change. Um, and with that, I know that that was, um, you know, it, we went through a year of it, of the way we were grading last year, and then there, was, there were surveys that went out to staff, there went out to parents, went out to students, um, and then that information was brought back to, I believe we started at a full staff meeting with the survey results and kind of broke it down worked in groups and kind of looked at it and you know then it was it was a, a long process of long but efficient because I think we were pretty good about making um, decisions that fit everybody and when I say we I mean a committee over the summer they took all of that information and that feedback and they created a committee which any staff member was um, asked if they would like to join and so the teachers that were part of that came up with the process that we're using now. And we all made a commitment to go through it for the year, and then we will do the same thing. We'll go back and we'll look at it. Okay, how did it go this year? What were the pros and cons? You know, what are some suggestions or feedback? And so we'll look at it this spring and move forward next year. And then the habits of work, um, that was, that was a big committee work where the kind of the um, effort and behavior and social pieces were pulled out of the grades and um, were, are set as a, a habit of work. Um, the, the schedule decisions, again, there's, there's always feedback because there are always issues. There's no perfect <laughs> schedule crew and rise. Um, similar to A East and advisory came out of committee work. Um, the parent teacher conference design that has changed over time. Um, again, with all with staff feedback because it looks different for each grade level. You know, in the spring conferences for eighth graders, they're looking at what am I going to take next year at the high school, and that's a big conference talking point, whereas the sixth graders, that's not an issue. So, you know, it's what does each grade level need, um, and that's always reviewed every year. And then district state testing schedules and special school activities. We um, started doing more, like, pep rallies. Um, last year we did one, one a month. This year it's it's not quite that, it's kind of as things come along, um, special activities. But again, it's, those ha that's been nice because it's not one 
set committee of teachers planning all of it. It's, okay, this is what we're looking at, this is what we want to do, who wants to be part of that? And then they get together and plan it. Sometimes it's driven by talent, ability to sing or dance, <laughs> right? I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else from the middle school? Um, so when it came to howls, crew and rise, things that involve staff but also affect students, um, we do student surveys, we get student input as well as staff, um, and all of our staff are part of the Howls and the Crew and the Rise, and so they all see them from different angles uh, and use them in different ways. And while they've um, evolved a lot from where we first started, I feel as though, especially with Rise, that everybody really feels like they've had their input, including the students, and we're really finding something that works really well for everybody and uh, continuing to check in what's working, how's it going, what can we do, and making improvements, and we make them along the way. Great, thank you. All right, we'll transition now back over to Wentworth, and I'll ask Principal Crosby to um, introduce your team members. <coughs> Hi, Kelly Crosby, I'm the principal of Wentworth. I'm just gonna hand the microphone. You guys can introduce yourselves, and maybe your role on the leadership team, because the four staff members that we brought um, are part of our Wentworth leadership team. Brem Stoner, assistant principal. Kelly Tukey, a fifth grade teacher and green community lead. Melissa Maddock, fourth grade teacher and red learning community lead. Sarah Thurn, I'm the allied arts lead teacher and I teach STEM. Diane Stoltz, I'm the special education consulting teacher. And they're fabulous. And Diane is the lead teacher for the special services community. So um, I'm gonna try to be brief because we're pretty similar in structure to what they described at the middle school. Even our graphic looks really similar. Um, so the um, colorful part at the top is exactly um, these folks here and others who weren't able to join us tonight. So this structure is really in place to ensure that everybody in our school a large school is connected to a learning community and has a direct liaison um, to the school leadership team. So in addition to the school leaders, each of our four classroom learning communities have a lead teacher and then our allied arts, which is Sarah, and student support community. Um, and you'll see who the membership is beneath, um, beneath that column, and then the special services community. So the leadership team, like the middle school mentioned, we also meet weekly for 90 minutes on Wednesdays. Um, it sounds like a lot of time, but it's never enough. Um, we have a rolling agenda as well that's collaboratively created. Um, lead teachers are adding items to the agenda. Um, Mr. Stoner and I are adding items to the agenda. We try to set times and um, we're a pretty efficient team and get a lot of work done, um, especially with the shared roles. So we're great at um, somebody's creating the learning community meeting agenda simultaneously as somebody who's taking notes, as somebody who's the timekeeper and the facilitator. So um, it's really great and a lot is accomplished. And then in addition to the Wentworth leadership team, each learning community meets weekly. So within the school day, our leadership team meeting is after school. But the learning community is with the teachers, um, meet within the school day, and um, they're working from that agenda that was built at the leadership team meeting. Their team members can add information and add agenda items as well, and that's really the place where they're talking it out from their um, kind of more narrow perspective, specific to the students that they're working with and their, their roles in the school. Um, and then there's a lot of other opportunities for collaboration and formal and informal leadership roles. So um, Mr. Stoner meets with the Ed Techs monthly, and he's done a really great job also going to the learning community meetings once per month and checking in with the staff on just student issues um, and keeping that loop really tight. Um, I meet with the office staff monthly and we collaborate in a lot of different configurations really dependent on what the purpose is uh, or the goal. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, that top part, you know, those three larger structures, the leadership team, then the learning community teams, and then our faculty faculty and curriculum professional development time. So those are the times that we have our whole staff together. It's not a one, two, three. It could be three, two, one, two, one, three. Um, 
it, so it's not a perfect cycle that way. It really all depends on what the goal and the purpose is. So I'm gonna use um, the schedule committee work as an example to illustrate kind of how this process works. So it's fresh on our minds. We're just about ready to, we're almost at that halfway point. We'll start revisiting how things are working and um, getting the feedback. So um, committee work really drives a lot of um, new initiatives or identified needs. So the schedule committee was a voluntary committee. Um, we really work hard to make sure that all stakeholders are represented. So we've got to have somebody who's representing the allied arts and special education and each of the grade levels, each of the learning communities so that we have those different perspectives on the team. Um, so we made a mission statement, we set the norms and we knew that our goal was to develop a master schedule that was really gonna get the most out of our instructional time. Um, so made sure that we had all that representation, did the research and the planning in the committee work, we identified priorities, collected feedback under like a praise, wish, wonder format, got feedback from the entire staff that way about what are your priorities in a schedule? What are your priorities? Um, how can we make the most out of the time that we have? Um, we read a book, we used a resource, Teach Like Finland, and then the schedule committee just dug in and did their work that was represented by all these different stakeholders. And once we got to a point where there was a draft, that's when the work of the schedule committee comes back to the leadership team. And the leadership team is really there to ask the questions and kind of poke holes in it and you know think critically from their different perspectives so that then refinement can happen in committee work. And then it's rolled out at the faculty PD or curriculum PD to the whole staff as a big overview. Here's, here's the information as we have it now. And then it's brought to the smaller learning community teams where they can really dig in at the implementation level. Like what does this exactly mean for us? And figure out all those really super important things like, well, where will we have the walkers line up at the end of the day on our learning community? And what time will snack be and those types of things. So um, that's just an example of how a big decision is made. And then now, um, the committee is just about to get together in two weeks to start the cycle all over again. Collect feedback, okay, what's been working well, look forward, um, and, and make adjustments as needed for next year. So it is really a big cycle. And then, so that's, that's for, you know, kind of the bigger picture decisions. Um, there's also just the business of schools that happens every single day. So those little decisions, schools run on details, and those things are all sorted out. It's not just Brem and I sitting in our office, you know, making these decisions. It's all sorted out through the leadership team, and we have formal ways of communicating that. We have a weekly staff news that goes out like clockwork. On Thursdays, they know that that's their one-stop shopping for where everything is, and then the pieces from that that go to families also go out on Thursdays. So we've got a great system of communication happening at Wentworth. And then, like I said, the configurations for different um, purposes, that whole middle column at the bottom is um, different configurations of teams that get together to support students. So those are just some examples of student support teams. And decisions aren't made in isolation. They're all always team-based decisions um, for, for students. So that's a lot of input and a lot of people getting together and putting their very best thinking together. And then there's a lot of additional ongoing collaboration, regular meetings with instructional coaches and our SEA building represent, um, representatives meet with Brem and I each month to just talk about things from the union perspective and keeping that um, flow happening. I meet with new teachers monthly. Um, I mentioned the ed tech trainings and then even having student voice in. Um, I have a little principal's advisory team. We meet monthly and it's the students who've been selected for um, respect recognition for following the respect code and they come and talk about, you know, what's the very best parts about Wentworth and what are some things that, you know, you wish were different and they give amazing feedback. Um, from the mouths of babes, right? They're the ones living it. And then the spirit committee is a student group and they plan all of our spirit days and things like that. So there's lots of, there's lots of input from um, many stakeholders. And these are some examples of collaborative decisions. A lot of it um, you heard from the other phase levels. These are, you know, our master schedule, the respect code, which is everything to do with student behavior. Um, so how do we celebrate when students are demonstrating 
you know, expected behavior? How do we support them when they're struggling with that? Our integration model, um, which is new this year, and we're really working hard to grow some legs with that to further support um, integration between allied arts in our um, core classrooms. Uh, the school start time schedule adjustments, you know, we had what we thought was like a really great plan and then you have to live it a little bit and then go back to the drawing board and just make sure that we're absolutely capitalizing on all of the time that we have. Um, and like I said, the agendas for just the business of school, those little decisions that are made all the time. Um, student input on all of those things. And our service clubs and school store are examples of um, kids driving change and um, just making the world a better place from eight, nine, and 10 year olds. They're awesome. So I, you guys want to chime in with anything? <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll chime in later. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Um, we'll transition now to another Kelly, Mullen Martin, at Blue Point School. Kelly, can you tell us about the teacher leaders that you have here tonight? I will. You, do you want to introduce yourselves? Sure. Hi, I'm Leah Lee, kindergarten teacher. And Marsha Grant, um, phys ed and health teacher. Amy Taylor, I'm a looping teacher and a lead teacher. I'm Kelly Barton, principal at Blue Point. Um, and as Diane said, I think we, we uh, all looked at this a little bit differently, which is great. And I feel like we're, we continue to drill down as we kind of go through the phases. So, um, and I think the challenge at K2, or the opportunity, is um, that we have three buildings um, with three cultures and climates and built, you know, these um, living organisms that we're running every day, but we're operating under this umbrella of a K2 phase, right? Where these three buildings, one school. So um, I think what you'll see in here as the three of us speak is um, how our three buildings run, but also how that's interwoven with the K2 leadership. So it's a little bit messy, but um, we make it work really well, I think. Um, so how I've laid out uh, to start off is just sort of the different roles um, at Blue Point, the opportunities for leadership. I don't think, um, I think leadership is really fluid in our district. I think you've heard that from all of the phases. Um, this is not an exhaustive list at all. Um, and I've tried to show sort of how it looks in the building capacity and then how that feeds into the phase level. So for example, Amy's the building lead. Um, she's my administrative designee. Um, she's the principal when I'm not there. She loves that. Um, <laughs> and she really represents the staff voice. Um, she's the liaison between the staff and me. Not that my door isn't always open. Um, but sometimes they feel more comfortable going to her with something or running it by her. Um, before coming to me, possibly. Um, then she represents that voice at the larger K2 leadership. Um, there's also a learning lead. Lori Bloom couldn't be here tonight. She's away. So they, they have a different role. She really um, supports teachers um, more around curriculum resources. Um, she's not in any way an administrative designee. And, and she also is part of that broader K2 um, leadership team. We also have a special ed consulting teacher who is that lead teacher for the special ed staff. Um, she uh, serves multiple roles. She supports all of the student support teams in all three buildings. She plays a really critical role for all of our students who struggle um, and provides that voice for all of K2 for special ed teachers, but also regular ed teachers as well. Our instructional coaches, Peggy Clemens is here um, tonight to represent them. They play a key role for all of our K2 buildings. Um, and they really play a dual role in terms of coaching teachers, but also being colleagues. You know, they attend faculty meetings and they're there as a colleague. They're leaders, but they're also um, right there alongside teachers as their equals. So um, it's a really great relationship. Um, Rose Pomelo is our, U, our U, union representative. I meet with her regularly. That's a key position in the building in terms of just staying on top of what any of the issues are. 
um, keeping that line of communication open. Um, Marsha is part of the district wellness team. She's just also a go-to person in the building, having been at Blue Point for a long time and just being a really trusted member of the staff. Um, Leah heads up the Sunshine Committee um, and is a really critical person in terms of supporting positive culture and climate in the building. And I think that that um, just goes a long way. And it, it focuses on staff a lot of the times, but that trickles down to students, definitely. Um, and we have some very happy staff at Blue Point. So thank you, Leah. Um, and, I, and there are so many other people that we could name, as, as Kelly Crosby was talking about, the business of school and all of the roles that come up. All of our staff are experts in their field. I mean, nurses and social workers. And they're just constant um, conversations and constant communication going on to make decisions for students based on need, based on data, based on um, whatever the item of the day is. It's, it's really constant, and it's never made by one person, and it's never in a bubble. So it's all the time. And um, these are just some examples of the different situations and mechanisms that go on um, that other people have already talked about. Um, you know, our faculty meetings are a way in our building, our smaller buildings, that a lot of building-based decisions happen. Um, we meet as a phase for our curriculum meetings, but our building time is sort of that one time that we really get to talk about Blue Point um, and what's going on here and what our needs are. And, you know, we have this decision to make or this is really specific to the needs of our kids or what's happening with our building. So we really hold that time, um, you know, close to our hearts. Um, and that's when we really get to talk about those things. Unfortunately, we don't have support staff there at this time, so we make sure that um, those agendas are open to all and that if we need feedback from the whole staff, that we get that feedback before anything is final. Um, so we always try to include everybody. Um, principal, staff, and community. I think that's sort of what I was talking about before, how nothing happens in a bubble. You know, we're collaborating with the PTA, we're, you know, we're getting feedback from staff, parents, students, if, you know, if we can. Um, so it's just that constant um, flow of feedback and looking at what the evidence is before making a decision. The teams that Kelly mentioned um, exist in our smaller schools. Um, student support team is one of them, so that's just an example. Um, Diane mentioned some of the teams at the middle school. Our student support team kind of wears a lot of those different hats, um, looking at kids through a, a bunch of different lenses and whatever they may need. So we can pretty much pull any uh, group of people together to address issues that our youngest kids may be having and use a really data-driven process to make those decisions and have parents involved in providing feedback and know what's going on. And then our K2 leadership team is the really broad um, team that pulls all those the three buildings together and makes some of the bigger decisions that the bigger buildings have been talking about. And there, that's where that loop comes in, where some of the feedback may be needed from the from the buildings and back to that K2 leadership team. There may be things that come from you know, central office that they need us to get feedback from leadership that may need to come back from the buildings and that's where some of the same kind of process that you've heard about at some of the bigger buildings, that same flow happens at K2 as well and it goes through that, that same loop. Great. Anyone from Blue Point want to add to what Kelly shared? Sure, I just want to add that um, something that has worked really well for all of us at Blue Point is each grade level, we're kind of a team, the K team, the first grade team, the second grade team, we really we meet weekly. And um, Kelly's wonderful, her door is always open, and you know, as a K team, we can say, hey, we want to put together a Dr. Seuss assembly, and um, can we do it this day? And she's great. And so I, I think the grade level teams are awesome, and we love to pull in a specialist like Marsha, 
For Jim, she's going to uh, be a big pair of green pants, I think, for Dr. Seuss <laughs> assembly in March. So uh, we all really collaborate. I think she did. So we're going to make them this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, we got to do that. Um, so yeah, it, uh, really a lot of collaboration. And Kelly's awesome with um, saying, sure, go for it. You know, And I, I just really appreciate that freedom of being able to um, uh, make our days creative and fun for all our little little five, six, and seven-year-olds before they head to Wentworth, so. Uh, sure, I would just add, <laughs> um, jumping off of the schedule, that's a huge deal at K2 also. And I know um, at one point it came up in a staff meeting and I think um, Kelly said something like, if you have any comments about the schedule, send in information. And we sent in our thoughts and somehow she took them and when I looked at the schedule and it came out in the prototype, I was like, wow, she was able to pull all thoughts together and um, get the schedule in a way that seemed to work for all the concerns that were brought up. And uh, the time changes too. Mm -hmm. And um, that felt pretty good because it's a lot of information, a lot of different perspectives to uh, pull together and make into your daily life minute by minute um, movement and um, I'm also just very thankful to be at Blue Point because I feel like I can talk to anyone <coughs> any of the teachers there or Kelly and um, be listened to and not always agreed with but it's okay to disagree <laughs> and that's a great feeling mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason to sitting back there <laughs> All right, and Lovejoy at Eight Corners. Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Lovejoy, and um, I'm going to let I'm gonna let the two people sitting next to me introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Kate Anderson. I'm the social worker at Eight Corners, but I'm also the building lead, and I think this is my third year being building lead. And Peggy Clements, K2 math instructional coach. I represent all three buildings. Peggy's been the lead teacher at Eight Corners a couple of times as well, so she speaks from, from authority in that position as well, experience. Um, so many of the things that um, Kelly Martin told us is going to, you're going to hear the same thing from me. We have very similar structures in the three little schools. We all have lead teachers, building leads, and learning leads. Um, obviously, they're different people in different buildings, but their roles are very similar. And I'm going to let Kate elaborate more on what those kinds of things look like. Um, the K2 leadership team is the overarching leadership team for K2, and we all send representation there. We all go, um, and that um, the composite of that group has changed off and on over years, um, obviously with people, but also with roles, and um, we continue to evolve and just meet the needs of the teachers as best we can, which is hopefully meeting the needs of the students as best they can. Um, I think one thing that's a little bit different at Eight Corners this year is we have a building leadership team, and you know I'm, I would like to turn it over to Kate to talk about that, just because she's such an integral part of it. Um, having full-time social workers is um, an enormous, enormous gift. Um, many schools do not have that, and she serves the purpose of guidance counselor, doing whole group lessons for classes on um, expected behavior, mindfulness, all kinds of things, as well as seeing um, kiddos with IEP-driven needs. So it's a dual role in many ways that most social workers in schools do not, do not play. And without a full-time social worker, I don't have any idea where we would be except I would not be here because <laughs> they are so important as to part of the little schools and keeping everybody um, in check and just being there every day, all day long, and not shared and not traveling and not um, itinerant the way they are in many other places. Um, so you want to go ahead another slide. I'd like to get to the building leadership slide. Keep going. So the building leadership team at Eight Corners, um, we meet monthly, and um, I'll turn it over to Kate to talk about that. Um, and see Okay, it's totally off the cuff, so bear with me. <laughs> um, Anne has done a really nice job in putting together a building leadership team. It was put out to all staff several years ago, um, and it's the opportunity for people to volunteer and come forward, and we meet once a month before our staff meeting, and we get a really nice representation from everyone, from specialists to all grade levels, 
Um, and much like the other phases, we talk about pressing issues. And school is an ever-changing, evolving, <laughs> moving part every day. And so um, each meeting might look very different. But we try to really hone in anything that um, staff and students and teachers have brought to us so that we can come up with a, um, a good agenda. The agenda is open as well at K2. Um, anyone can get on there and put in whatever is pressing. But um, this team gets together and talks about the needs of the building. And I do believe that um, you know, Anne will bring forth things from, from uh, central office. We bring forth things from families that we hear, from students. And it's a really nice working team. Um, I think we problem solve really well. I feel like you know, Marcia was saying, I can bring anything forward. And I think we're efficient, um, we're data driven. We take a lot of data at K2. We have a student support team that meets and really looks at data um, before we go forth and make decisions. Uh, we try to involve families as best we can on most things. And um, I think that covers it for the building, the BLT leadership team. The nice thing is also that the three K2 <coughs> schools are really trying hard to um, model, have a model of a building leadership. And I think we're all, we meet a lot together, at least the K2 leadership team does. So that issues that might be happening at Pleasant Hill or at Blue Point or at Eight Corners, um, we're all together making that decision so that um, the kids are getting as, as um, consistent in experience as they can. Obviously, every building is a little different and it can never be exactly the same, but we try really hard to have a lot of open and good communication and um, make those decisions among the three K2 schools so that when they get to Wentworth, everyone feels like they've had a very similar experience. Um, yeah, and another thing I just want to point out is that we have a slightly different leadership structure at K2 because we do have the building lead and the learning lead. The learning leads really take on the role of um, mentoring new teachers, um, helping teachers know what's coming up in the next few weeks or month, whether it's being ready for parent-teacher conferences um, or organizing uh, things around the curriculum and really honing in on those academic kinds of pieces. The building lead is a huge job and is um, completely unique to K2. And, I'm going to say this right now. It is completely um, not funded correctly. <laughs> they do not, they underfunded, thank you, that was the right word. Um, for Kate to have the responsibility of being in charge of the school when I'm not there um, is tremendous. You know, if this child is having a crisis, she's the one that's going to call a parent or call crisis or call whomever that needs to handle that. Um, it's not just a little discipline issue or something small. These are big issues that happen at K2. Um, and I think it's just um, some, it's a big job. And I she didn't say much about it, but I will say it for her because it's a big job. And all three of the people that do this job work really hard and do a go above and beyond, um, you know, some of the things that other phase levels are expected to do, I believe, as, as teachers, um, as lead teachers. So it's, it's a unique position. So I just want to put that out there right now. And I would just add to, and maybe, you know, Ann and Kelly, you might want to elaborate. It used to be just one lead teacher job at K2. My first year here, that's how it was. And then from feedback th through the teachers, through the principals to central office, they came up with this proposal of splitting the job because people weren't wanting to do it. <coughs> it's just too much to be handling, you know, being the pseudo principal when the principal is not in the building, which we know guaranteed is going to happen every Tuesday when we have our district-wide leadership meetings, um, not to mention other times that they need to collaborate with their co colleagues. Um, so we, the K-2, this came from the teachers through the principals to split the jobs just to make it more appealing to folks. And even though we've had to recruit now twice the staff, I think that, you know, from what I'm hearing anecdotally, it's really made it more attractive. Would you add anything to that? With the exception of what Ann just said about the pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had to split the pay. So that's. That's what you said sums it up. It's a, you know, and for, all, thank you. Um, for all intents and purposes, it's an assistant principal job along with your regular job mm -hmm. because you don't have that, cent that you know, middle you know, piece of principal, assistant principal, and then leads. Right. We take on that role. It's a good yeah. way to and yes, it. We're, our buildings are smaller, but we're busy. <laughs> it's busy every day. The needs are mighty. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Anne? You would wanna? Or uh, I don't Maggie? think so. So um, yeah, so I think um, Kate covered it, but. 
Building leadership team has been a tremendous um, bonus for the school because it, we include, that's not even a full list, I'm not sure what happened to the rest of the list, but we have somebody from each grade level, which like Leah Lee said, each grade level is a team amongst them, themselves. Um, and then we have representation of all the um, specialists or allied arts or um, you know, music library, PE. Um, and we also try to have um, ed tech res representation as well. And sometimes those people are duplicates and we also have our SEA rep. So um, because when you have a, s a school the size of our little schools, 16 ed techs out of the staff when I have 12 home rooms and I have 16 ed techs, they are a huge part of the fabric of the culture of the school. They need to be heard, they need to be a part of the fabric, they need to be a part of the decision making. They're out at recess, they're at lunch, they're with kids all day long, every day, all over the place. And it's not fair to make decisions about things that they're really Their work. everywhere <laughs> without them. So um, it's hard after school to have faculty meetings without them, but um, we're not able to do that uh, currently. And it, we're not able to have meetings with them during the school day because they're with kids all the time. And with arrival and dismissal the way it is, they are not free enough to ever have more than a five minute meeting, which is really not enough to even say hello to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's really important and it's really awesome that people are willing to come in and volunteer their time to be a part of building leadership because it does have to happen outside of the school day as all of our meetings do because we do not have enough coverage. We do not have enough people in our buildings to allow for um, teams to meet during the day the way they do at other phases. Um, we have been able to, at, at least at Eight Corners and maybe at the other, some of the other schools, I'm not sure exactly what your schedules are, but I have made um, special arrangements so that once a week the K team meets over lunch and recess, once a week the sec first grade team and the second grade team, they, those four teachers at least have one duty-free day a week to meet and they are covered in between so that when their kids are getting on their snow pants, there's someone else in the classroom to help them out with that so that they can have a uninterrupted maybe 35 or 40 minute meeting by the time they get their kids to lunch and then get back to the meeting or get their kids, anyway. So it's just really tricky to do anything during the school day with a larger group of teachers with more than two teachers at any given time because of the number of people in the building, just because of the number of resources and the amount of support we have. So. Um, we do the best we can, and I think we're happy places, and I think we're, you know, it's, it's just, a, just a different, slightly different skew than the other bigger buildings have because we just don't, we don't have the capacity that they do with people, so. Thank you, Anne. Next. Um, uh, I'm just going <laughs> to add the kind of organization um, tiers of the leadership, so um, the ICs meet with the principals in Monique and um, discuss curriculum and plan a professional development map and plan out the meetings ahead of time and the have-tos like our SLOs and our PEBGs and where those land. And then the ICs meet with the learning leads so that we can communicate between the teachers and they help us plan the curriculum meetings and again the PD maps. And then they all meet to all the learning leads and building leads meet with the principals. So we have separate meetings, but then we all kind of communicate in between for that. Um, and I have to say that the um, set aside time for grade level meetings are a really important part for us as instructional coaches to be able to meet with a group of teachers at a grade level if we need to do any training or any communicating, check in on uh, student progress and so forth. And um, so that decision was fabulous. Um, it was done by kind of beg, borrow and, borrow, and stealing from all over the place. So added time like that would be really great. Great, thank you. Now give it to Jessica. Hi, um, I'm Jessica Steele, principal at Pleasant Hill, and I brought with me three fabulous um, educators in our building. Lisa Roberts, kindergarten teacher and former building lead. 
recovering. <laughs> <laughs> Julie Coughlin, another kindergarten teacher. Kate Swinburne, academic support, learning lead, and building lead. She's my right hand. Um, so first of all, I want to say it's been a real pleasure this year to be, um, along with Brim Stoner, the newest members of leadership um, in Scarborough. So um, high five, Brim. We're doing good. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, and Ed. Hey, Ed. Sorry. <laughs> um, so what we were hoping to demonstrate to you through our, our chart, we saw everyone else had a chart, so we made one too, um, is really that the K2 level is looking at, we are working across buildings, and we're also working within our buildings. So you can imagine that that is tricky. We're not as big, um, don't have as many staff as the other schools do, but um, we also don't cross paths at 12 o'clock at lunch by the microwave so that we can't, we really have to be consistent, careful, and intentional about the way that we communicate with each other and how we make those decisions. Um, so what we thought might be fun from Pleasant Hill is to <laughs> explain a couple of the decisions we've made. If you want to go to the next. Um, this slide just is reiterating what everyone else has said. We've got a K2 leadership team, the building leadership team, and then at Pleasant Hill um, and also in the other K2 schools, and I'm sure everywhere, we do try to make sure to give staff who can't attend a face-to-face -face meeting the opportunity to have a voice through lots of uh, like Google Forms and surveys and voting and that kind of stuff. So we're, we are very um, acutely aware that not everybody can come to a meeting, but they still need a voice. And so we do that very frequently across all of our schools in our district. Um, so I'm going to have our teachers explain um, a couple of the decisions that we have made this year. We would like to trademark the after-school trolley, so don't steal that idea. Um, we had a bathroom issue this year that we used a consultancy protocol with um, that worked out really well, was successful, and then um, we had to come together to create the PLT late start schedule, which was something that the Pleasant Hill staff said uh, when I came on board that was always a problem. So they're just going to go through those really quickly with you. As you all know, the year started very differently with start times. And we, along with having a new principal, needed to figure out how we were actually going to start each day and end it. So that was a big part of figuring out. Jessica put out an email <laughs> to us over the summer inviting any staff who wanted to to participate one summer day to talk about what should work well, or ideas we had to make it work well for our children. Um, it was wonderful. It was from office staff, classroom teachers, specialists, and ed techs. So it was anyone who would be involved. And I actually felt not as important as a, kin as a kindergarten teacher because I stay in my room. It was wonderful to hear from all the other people who are actually involved in walking the kids down the hall and what they see. Because I don't see the buses. I don't even know where the names all the time. Because um, I'm in my classroom with my kids, so it was just a wonderful way to start a year with a new principal and get a really nice feel of being a community, making decisions. Okay. Oh, so then we had a second meeting because that meeting, it was wonderful. We looked at maps, we talked about things. We really, we actually went and went on a field trip down the hall to say what would work, and we acted it out. It was different this year with buses, knowing that they we wouldn't have a lag time, and we knew our kids had to be ready quickly. And how were they going to make sure they got to these buses? Even though we have little schools, we don't see the doors. So we developed, um, I believe it came from another school with, who had tried it before. We have s staff who come along and pick up the children for each bus. So <coughs> actually creating a trolley. They start in the kindergarten wing, they pick up the kids for bus five, and they walk down the hall and get them and take them up to the bus, and the next person comes. And it, it's efficient, it's fabulous. We've had people out, we've had people have to help because it is so easy, anyone subbing for it can do it without a problem. So feel free, um, yeah. you can come be part of our trolley. Um, so it's, it's been fabulous, so it was a great way to solve problems, but it was very unknown how this year was gonna go with the start times. Great. We did have a bigger issue. Um, I, I know you probably won't believe this, but K2 kids do have problems in the bathroom. Um, so as a staff, we had to figure out what is the problem, how do we solve this? And um, it was at the very beginning of the year, and it was nice because we had a full staff day. So we were able to come together, and we did a um, consultancy protocol, and it really dug deeper into the problem. What is the actual problem? When are we seeing it? Um, who's being affected by it? And if you look at the slide, um, so our problem was 
we wanted to make sure that the bathroom was getting covered because there was some issues happening. So first we had to discuss um, what is the dilemma. From there, we had to ask clarifying questions so we could get to know a little bit more. When is this happening? Is it an accident or is it really happening on purpose? Um, and then from there, we went to probing questions. And what was nice about this model is all the staff was together at once and we all got to talk about it. So everybody had a voice, which was very beneficial to dealing with this problem. Um, so then we had to do probing questions. After that, we really had to analyze kind of the steps of it. Why is it happening? When? What are we going to do about it? Um, from there, we did a lot of brainstorming. What would be a good <coughs> idea to solve this problem? What are practical ideas we can do throughout the day? Can we collect data on it to see when it is happening? Um, and from there, we summarized it and we reflected on it. And we came up with a great plan. Um, we had a plan so we'd know when kids were coming in from recess and using the bathroom. We had a checklist of who it was that was using the bathroom. We knew times. We knew everything basically to the minute. Um, and from there, we were able to say, OK, this is why it's happening. This is when it's happening. And we were really able to, from there, pinpoint what is it that we're able to do to fix this problem. And just the flow of this really worked very nicely. Everyone's voice was heard. People that sometimes we don't even hear from had some fantastic ideas. And we were able to use those ideas. So it was nice that it was a real full staff effect. And we reflected on it since. If it was successful, would we make any changes? And how do we do it again if we need to? So I have the, um, excuse me, I have a cold as well. So. Um, the PLT late start schedule. So we share specialists like art, music, PE, um, some of our specialists. So again, our schedules are pretty tight. So on late start days, some of the kids miss their special art, music, whatever, and they only get it once a week. Mm -hmm. So there was always the dilemma of they're going to always miss it, but the rest of the kids get their regular schedule. How can we be fair and equitable to the kids? And um, again, they all get the same thing. So we sat down again as a group. Anyone who wanted to come in the morning we sat down and said, how can we solve this? And again, the people who were involved um, who, or, or were affected, like the librarian and the music teacher and so forth, were also part of the decision making. And we kind of brainstormed what would work best. And we came up with a nice little handy schedule so that every student still got a briefer, um, instead of 40 minute special, they got a 30 minute one. And um, but each child still got their special. And we also built in a community meeting. We had started that the year before. And um, we wanted to make sure that it was always on a consistent day or time of the month. So we built that into that schedule as well. And that seems to be working pretty well. And if there's any changes, um, Jessica's always really good about getting that schedule out to staff so they have it ahead of time when they're doing their plan books and things like that. She's always good about updating us, um, putting out a Thursday update, so that we have all of that um, when we're planning our instruction in our weeks. So. Is there anything else you wanted to add about Pleasant Hill? OK, so I think we're doing well on time. I'm going to ask Monique to go ahead and present before we do questions. So hopefully you're jotting as we go. Um, and Monique, if maybe well, you can hold the wireless or stand at the podium. Up. So central office. Um, Monique, our, just before you start, um, yes. you, can you just introduce yourself with your full title so that everyone knows who you are? Thank you. Um, I've been here so long I forget. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, not who I am. Um, <laughs> that was last year. Um, <laughs> I'm, Monique. <laughs> uh, I'm Monique Colbert. I'm the director Inside of curriculum and assessment um, here in Scarborough. Um, okay. And I am a member of a team in the central office, along with the superintendent and assistant superintendent. There are a number of departments in the central office. Um, I head curriculum instruction and assessment. There's also special services, information technology, which is a shared department with the town, uh, the business office and facilities um, as well. Uh, school nutrition is housed over at Wentworth. That's another central office department as well. And transportation. Um, pardon, transportation, sorry. Transportation. Forgot Sarah. <laughs> <clears throat> 
So depending on the type of decision that we make, um, the key is communication and collaboration. So we tend to make the large decisions that cross phase levels um, or are large in scale. And I'll talk specifically about my area in the curriculum and assessment department. Our really first step is to really reach out and connect with the building leadership. As we meet every week with leadership council, we're able to network with those principals who may be involved in a particular decision. So for example, our current project right now is developing a K-5 report card that is electronic. So I will grab the building leaders. <laughs> grab the building leaders at K-5. If we need to schedule some extra time, we schedule some extra time. And we talk about putting a plan together to engage um, folks, uh, not only teachers, but also getting student and parent feedback on that. So we develop that plan. We engage all those who have a role in that outcome. We identify how to do that. Sometimes it's working through the current leadership structures that exist at the buildings. Sometimes it's through the curriculum folks like the instructional coaches. Sometimes it's uh, doing an all call out there for um, a committee of whoever might be interested. So it depends on the particular task. Uh, usually when we gather that group together, it's about them gathering some information, analyzing the information, and making recommendations to leadership to develop some implementation plans. We also try to reflect on that process and communicate, communicate, communicate. Sometimes it's very easy for a particular group when they get going is, and they, they climb a learning curve in terms of what they're working on to keep working and working and working without updating people along the way. So that's one of our ongoing challenges is to update people along the way. So to give you a little bit of um, some idea of some <coughs> what some large scale curriculum adoptions might look like, most recently K-5 literacy, middle school science, um, Local assessment products, I'll share a little bit about where we are right now with that, but technology decisions um, in days gone by, sometimes that would be software selection, um, and student devices. In all of these cases, a really important piece is criteria. We look at the criteria about around what we want. We gather the information on that, and then we rate and make a decision based on that information. So a couple of examples. When we put the K-5 literacy curriculum together, Back in February 2014, as you heard before, we talked about norms and working agreements of this group. We wanted a diverse group, as you can see by the representation on the left-hand side. We didn't just have classroom teachers, but we also had some of those specialists who would also be involved in that curriculum implementation. We also involved a school board member as part of that process as well. If you go to the next slide, we worked through our process. Um, on the left-hand side, I know you can't read those little details, but on the left-hand side are the curriculum materials that we reviewed and then the results of that review. The committee also makes recommendations specific to implementation. What does the professional development, what are the supports that teachers need? And that's my job and central office's job is to put those supports in place to make sure that the teachers have the supports they need to do the quality work that they um, do with students. On the right-hand side, that's an example of a rating form. Uh, typically, there's a whole lot of criteria, and one of the first steps usually in the process is to identify what are the priorities in time, terms of criteria. So, for example, if it's a curriculum adoption, one of my non-negotiables is evidence of effectiveness. But there's other criteria in terms of ease of use for the classroom teacher. There's other criteria in terms of fair and unbiased assessments. So we work through those criteria in order to identify what's most important for us and what's going to work for Scarborough. In the next slide, you can see a current project underway, we're looking at our universal screeners. We've been using a product from Renaissance called Star Assessment. We have a legal requirement to universally screen students in math, in mathematics and in literacy across the grade levels. And we're not happy with our current uh, screener. We're not happy with our current screener based on the feedback that's coming from teachers. So here's a process that we've developed. Um, what I do is I've been in the process, actually um, met with um, middle school this week and the K2s last week, and in this case, I'm going out to each of the schools, speaking to each of the staffs, each of the teacher groups, um, and sharing what we're doing now, why we're doing that, and how they can get involved. On the right-hand <coughs> side is the list of criteria we're using. So on the next slide, <clears throat> I articulate to the teachers, your involvement's important, and here are three ways in which you can get involved. The first way to get involved is I share the criteria with the teachers, and we fill out a Google form, a Google survey, so I know they have three votes on those criteria. So I can see at the middle school, what are the criteria that are important to the middle school teachers? What are the criteria that are important to the uh, teachers at Wentworth? Um, so we can take a look at that, and the second way to get involved is to become involved 
involved in the assessment focus group. And the assessment focus group will look at all of that data. What we've gotten from teachers is we want to talk to some end users. We've sort of, we've heard the sales pitch, but now let's find out from people who are really using it. And so we gather all of that data and there are forms people can fill out. And the assessment focus group will come together and look at all of that data and rate all of that data to make a final recommendation. The other way of going about it is teachers can use one of those criteria feedback forms if they know a colleague or as a parent, their students come home with a report of, from one of those products, they can give us some feedback and that will all be included. So those are some of the ways in which I use, um, I've used um, feedback from teachers to help make quality decisions um, in the area of curriculum and assessment. And it's not unlike what some of the other areas <coughs> in terms of central office do um, as well. Great, thank you Monique. Um, so really what we tried to do, and of course you didn't hear from every department, Allison or Chris are here, they could share a bit about how decisions are made within the special education department. Um, Todd also has a process, but really our idea is, you know, how do we bolster educator expertise in our decision making process? And so we have this, and it's not linear, it's not even a cycle, sometimes it's a squiggly line and it looks like a tangled ball of yarn, um, but we try to um, get input from our, ed our educational experts, the folks that are on the ground, the folks who the decisions are going to um, affect daily <coughs> in their efforts toward serving our students really well. And then it comes to leadership, the leadership council, which is all of your central office administrators, plus all of your principals, all of your assistant principals, all your directors. Um, and then, you know, if and when it's something that the school board must take an action on, we then bring that recommendation to the school board. It's not always that clean either because oftentimes board members are a part of the process, um, which we think is an enhancement and helps us make a good decision. And even when the board doesn't have to take specific action on a decision, we like to have presentations to inform you of changes that are going to be made, much like the high school is doing with their grading and reporting practice. That's not something the board has to take action on, but certainly we want high school leadership to come to the board and report out on their findings um, and the adjustments they're going to be making to their grading and reporting practice because we want you to be really informed if you're stopped in the grocery store or at some sort of extracurricular event um, or somebody sends you an email we don't want you to have to go back and say like oh I don't really know about that let me find out our goal is to try to minimize the number of surprises that you have coming your way um, and really want to to instill in you trust and confidence that um, each of these processes are constantly being iterated and adjusted based on the task, based on the work that's before us, um, and we're, we're certainly open to feedback and how we can improve. Um, I know that I have seen in my short time here um, these processes at each building really evolve um, and include more and more teacher voice and involvement in the decision making process. The, the last thing I'll say before I open it up to questions is that, um, well, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions before I say that. So, any questions you guys have, feel free to just kind of call or I have two, through the chair. I just say I have two questions, and they're not, they're more spe specific because they were brought through, and I just didn't know what they were. The school refusal team at the middle school, what is that? So that's an. It's interesting that you asked that because just this week we were talking about the fact that that is a name that existed when I came on board last year and I said we've got to figure out a, a different way to brand that name, brand the work of that committee. So the, <laughs> that committee's work is really looking at um, attendance, okay. at, at kids who are having um, a difficult time with school attendance and sometimes it is around some school refusal anxiety around attending school. But thank you for validating <laughs> my questioning about why are we called that. <laughs> so we, instead of calling our dropout, instead of calling it the dropout prevention committee, um, Kathy Terrell, our improvement strategist, came up with the, na the name Every Student Graduates Committee. So similar to try Absolutely. to flip it to a positive. <laughs> Thank you. And then Peggy, you mentioned SLO. Yes. What is that? Um, well, through the PEBG program. You have to decipher all the acronyms. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me go back. The state, the state has now requirements on how teachers are evaluated. 
and the SLO is part of that, and it's the student learning objective. So we have to show, each teacher has to show 15% um, growth um, in a cohort of students based on a specific learning target, and then that's figured into your evaluation um, system, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, before I turn it over completely to questions, thank you for putting this together. This, the amount of effort that went into this was huge and it's greatly appreciated. It was a great foundation. Even after a year, I had really no idea how decisions were made. So it was great to hear all of that in place. With that said, open it up to members of the board for questions. Okay. I have one. Um, so a lot of buzzwords were said and all the ones that you want to hear. <laughs> When you're talking about collaborative decision making, things like uh, input and teams and communication and evidence-based decision making and data, and I could keep going, but I won't. My question actually does not have to be answered by every school, but I'd love a couple to pipe up and, and answer, how do you strike a balance? Because it's very easy to get in these cycles of improvement or cycles of decision making and wind up in a whirlpool like that giant circle of ice that's in Westbrook right now. <laughs> um, so basically, I, I want to know, how do you strike a balance between due process and efficiency so that you can be most effective? Sometimes the calendar dictates things. So for example, um, depending on what project, and I'll just pick on the K-5 report card thing, we, we're targeting, our target is to have a new one ready by fall. So we kind of work backwards from that. Um, so the calendar sometimes will dictate that, uh, whether or not, you know, we wanted one last year, that wasn't able to happen, so we move things and we're constantly adjusting things. Um, uh, so that's one driver for us, is that deadline. Deadlines are very good. Yeah. <laughs> I know some of the parameters are school policy um, that we have to follow and the, and the teacher contract um, and, and faculty contract. So um, that, that kind of reigns in some of the you know, depth of the world pool as well. I think another part of the balance, if you want to pass it down to Kelly, we're going to say, another part of the balance while the mic is being passed is being really clear up front when we're bringing folks together. Are you providing input? Are you making a recommendation? Or are you actually making the decision? Um, I know that even during my entry plan process, that was a, a very clearly expressed frustration um, by folks at multiple levels of the organization. And you know, our leadership team pulls me on the carpet about that. Like, so are we actually making this decision or are we just giving you feedback? And so that's something that I'm learning to be much more clear upfront about. And I think it engages people in a different way when they know what their role is. Yeah. I think having a well-represented leadership team too, so just trusting the judgment and expertise of the teacher leaders who are representing a cohort who have a similar um, you know, goal, similar work, job alike that we can, um, if a decision has to be made quickly or efficiently, um, I can trust the leadership team that they're representing the voices of many. I would, I'd say um, that that's a, that's a really important question though uh, that you were just asking because at the high school, uh, I know and I think the other schools feel this way as well, within their schools that works out really well. But I, I do think that, that, that what you were just asking is a weakness that, that we've seen in the sense that we are, we're oftentimes uh, chasing whatever is the newest uh, initiative from the state and, and um, the SLOs are a great example of that. You know, we just talked about the whole grading thing from the last year. That was not coming from the building. Uh, and now the SLOs, that is not coming from staff. And in fact, we just, ironically, we just got a presentation this week about how we're supposed to do that and uh, a, a law to repeal the SLOs was also put in. So we all are saying, great, you know, now, now we're working on something that we already know. It's basically like, the ships already hit the iceberg, and they were still being asked to get on it, you know. And so, well, it's not repealing um, SLOs. No, we it's, just went to a no. Well, yeah. it's repeal right, but it's repealing it's, it's the It's repealing the it. the weighting of the SLO in your right. summative evaluation, right. which I think is so a good I'd, thing. So I'd like to speak a little bit to that because um, when we design the SLOs, the SLOs are still going to be part, but um, when we designed it, 
um, we, uh, people, people here were on the committee, we did not go with the state model, which was the calculation. We decided to do the Scarborough calculation, and um, the Scarborough calculation did not have any of the state measures. Mm -hmm. And so we just, I talked to the state along with uh, a couple of our other colleagues in other districts, and matter of fact, they labeled it the Sizemore SLO because it doesn't <laughs> have any of the state calculations in it. And I said, let's try it. Let's just see what happens because the state calculation was very complicated, did not make sense. Uh, probably 90% of the people didn't understand it. And so we said, how are we going to do that to teachers, what the state is asking? So we dropped it and went with our own. We heard today that SLOs are still going to be continuing, but the weight is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've already started talking a little bit about that. So I think we simplified our SLOs not to go with what the uh, state model was. And, and I think that that gets to what we're talking about, that one of the things I've said in all my years as department head is I feel like often my job is to be an umbrella to keep all the crap from landing on my department. And I feel like kind of what you're trying to do there is appreciated, but it's still not, it's not anything that is going to really benefit students in, in the way that it's set up. It, it's, a, it's a new paperwork um, method that is not gonna have any kind of measurable effect. It's super easy to, um, to, for people to put in bad data and you know bad data in, you're gonna get bad data out. So, you know, I appreciate the effects to mitigate the damage, but that really is what you end up feeling like you're spending a lot of time doing. So, and, and mitigation is taking away from the time of people wanting to really do really excellent work. Mm -hmm. my, my question um, relates to Eric's comment. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in um, knowing what mechanisms and processes are in place for um, staff voice in, in decisions we make as a board, um, whether it's a decision we have to make based on the state asking you guys to chase your tails m further and then you're spending time doing that rather than um, doing what you need to do with kids, or whether it's another um, initiative that we might be considering, what processes are in place to ensure that your voices are heard? Well, I would for me, the, it's for, it's for anybody. Well, I, mean, I would frame it. I think probably first for teachers to understand what decisions the board makes. The primary decisions you make are around policy um, that affect that come back and affect the work that we do. And so our process for that, as you know from our conversations in policy, is to utilize these building decision making structures so that the key people, and I'll use nurses as an example because we just were working on a policy that they had input on, is to work through the building structure for those experts that the policy is going to directly affect to then make recommendations to the policy committee who will then make recommendations to the board. Um, so if we were to think about um, another recent issue would be start times. And so the way that that would be done well would be for individual buildings to be talking about what are the challenges, what are the benefits of the policy prior to the decision being made um, rather than after the decision is made so that then from the buildings you can have a presentation on here's how this is going to you know, benefit or challenge us um, if, if and when it comes to implementation point. And I think that can really inform decision making as well. Right, and I guess I guess that's that's what I'm wondering. You know, like, like you you mentioned the start time decision. You know, if like like if there's another decision that's coming down the pike, this board's going to vote on. How do we ensure that prior to that vote that there are processes in place so voices are heard prior to the vote rather than after the vote? Well, maybe and maybe to pinpoint that a little bit more. Like I'd love to hear from the teachers and administrators how you would see that happening? Like, how would that best work for you f so that you would feel like you had given the type of information that we are looking for? Yes. Is that, sorry, I didn't want to step that, on you, but that No, that's perfect. To what I was going to say. Absolutely. Um, in thinking about that going forward, I really appreciated you being at the initial meetings about budgets and needs, and um, I think that's the first time I've ever spoken with a school board member at my building um, about what's going on at eight corners. 
And so in looking to the future, I find it exciting to have more school board members coming directly to us. Um, I thought that was a great opportunity for staff, and I think we had a lot of people come and meet with you all. And um, I'm hoping that maybe that becomes a model um, of having you guys in our schools and seeing what's happening on the front lines and asking questions. I mean, that'd be great. Thank you. Oh, I'll pass it back to you. Um, I would just add that I don't think there's anything that would prevent that kind of feedback. I think we just need to create those opportunities. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as Julie said, you know, if there, if there is an opportunity to, to join, you know, a policy meeting and invite teachers that would be relevant to that, I, I think teachers would come, you know, or administrators would come. I just don't think those invitations have necessarily been made mm -hmm. or, you know, that coverage would have to be provided or we, we just need to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I would echo that having um, board members more in touch directly. Um, as you can see, when you look through the layers through which um, decision making goes and the loops and the strands, um, that there's, there are constant decisions in progress. And um, sometimes that voice um, in the trenches can be, um, can be somewhat muffled, not intentionally, but because of so much going on in school systems. And as we are, uh, with this example, for example, most current for us because at the high school we're just coming out of a, a presentation on SLOs on Monday. And, um, you know, a good question to ask, because we always encourage curiosity among our students, is, is what, where did the process start? So when you are looking at information, where, how did we come to this? And where was the teacher input and what was the process? Where was the student input? Where was the parent input? Those are all really good questions. So the more you are um, using strong inquiry and really truly asking what is the problem? What is truly the challenge that is that we're trying to solve here, and then going through that inquiry of voice, are you hearing from truly the stakeholders, that then you can really make strong decisions and also support the decisions that might be, that are being presented to you and to our, our leadership. So I was just going to add, I think it's more around being deliberate about what are the protocols that we build in so that they're repeatable and predictable and that we're not relying on what do we want to do this time, what do you think the best approach is. I think that if we are deliberate in how we craft those things and then take that process and continue to use it in different situations, then we guarantee um, what you're talking about, Amy. And I think there's already some, some systems in place. For instance, the community forums. Um, I find I've attended all of them, and the uh, community input is, is huge, mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're working with teachers. So it's, um, it's not either or. It's, it's community teachers working together, and I think a multifaceted means of gathering information, be it surveys, um, participate in some of these leadership team opportunities, come to visit our schools, um, have the community forum night, and I think as many different ways as you can ga gather information of what us as a community of Scarborough want, not just teachers, not just kids, not just community, but all of us together mm -hmm. is what really is gonna make it most powerful, I think. Yeah, thank you, Peggy. Um, Kelly, had a comment? I think one of the things that we're sort of missing in this equation is culture. Um, <clears throat> because I think that decision making is built around building a culture of being able to and wanting to be able to um, express what the needs are um, of our communities and of our learners, really. Um, so I think, I'm thinking of Kelly specifically because 
she was new to her position in our building when we moved to the new Wentworth. <clears throat> and the culture is slowly changing because of a change in leadership. Um, and, and it's going in a great direction. Uh, but it takes an awful lot amount of time because people have to build trust and all these things. So, you know, I think you reaching out as a school board and saying we want to involve more stakeholders and really get involved and dig in, um, you're starting to set that culture into play. Uh, but it's not going to happen this year. And it'll start to happen a little bit next year, and it'll be more so. You know, it just takes time, so it, there's a bit of patience that needs to happen with decision making can, processes. Can I add before you pass that? I just that's something I've been thinking about a lot. Is is <coughs> it, regarding Amy's question, but also sort of long term as an organization, how frustrating it must be for you to have. <laughs> um, it seems like there's a fast turnover in administration, and then you've got a the, the turnover and board and and um, and then you talked about the state law changes and it and so it's like a m these moving targets and um, how can you or what are your suggestions as you think about Amy's question for sort of maintaining some of this progress that you make in culture and in decision making so that it it withstands the change of administration and it was withstands the change of board and it is there a way that you can contemplate like the protocols or, or something so that it, it's it's something that we don't lose as as you gain it. I was actually going to address two two specific examples right there. Uh, I think one new thing we're doing this year that's working really well is um, Joanne and Julie are coming down once a month to our ILT meetings and I think that's a huge uh, a huge plus because uh, now they can see what we're going through and, and hear the, you know, the, the practical things on the ground that we're struggling with and we can hear what they're trying to get through. So I think that that is something that really needs to be ingrained and made into a regular, a regular thing. Um, and it shouldn't be every time because that's not an efficient use of people's time, but certainly some type of regular uh, uh, connection like that is a, a good development. And I think the other thing, um, I, I don't recall any time in all my years as department head um, sitting down and being asked um, as a high school to provide to uh, the school board or the uh, or the superintendent's office a list of our kind of top three or four priorities of what we think needs to be done, what we think are our weaknesses, because um, we feel like we have some real strengths and some real weaknesses. Uh, but I think you know that was kind of a regular process where you were saying, "Hey, um, each building, you know, meet with your ILT and and give us your you know, your top three concerns, your top three things that need to be worked on, and just made that your kickoff um, every year or or your finish, because uh, we do that as a department. Um, mm -hmm. But that would be a great kind of process to implement. That would that would give some some real direction and help us all be feeling like we're all working on something that's really useful. Eric, I want to thank you. I, um, I know I felt that this year going to the uh, ILT meeting once a month has been really very beneficial, hearing from staff and working together with the ILT, and um, I, I hope that continues because it's been really um, a good discussion group to hear both sides. Well, and I think for the same, I would echo what Eric and Joanne are saying about that one change. I think the, the sustainability comes from our teachers feeling empowered and trusted. And so boards will change, leadership will change. I mean, we, we know that, that's inevitable. But the people who are here the longest are our teachers. And so if we can establish that confidence in them and that trust in them and they feel empowered to be a critical decision maker, then that's gonna withstand the changes in leadership. Because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, at the end of the day, any leader who's gonna come in is hopefully going to be able to listen to and see what's working well. And I love Eric's suggestion of starting with those, you know, the top three or four priorities each year, if that became part of you know, what our summer retreat as a school board. Um, we get that information in June or May, and then we use that throughout the summer to plan for the upcoming school year. Then we're always gonna be not only saying we value teacher's vo voice, but actually changing our behavior in a way that will become part of the community's culture, and they'll be expecting it. Like, where's that conversation about the teacher's priorities? Um, and that will, to me, that will withstand the, the transitions in leadership. 
So first of all, I just want to thank you all as a school board novice. Um, this is really valuable to me, so I appreciate you taking the time um, outside of your work to, to do this. Um, my question is similar around sort of community engagement. I know, Kelly, you talked a little bit about parent um, and, and community and guardian engagement, and Kate, I heard you mention it as well. But I'm curious from, from the other schools, what sort of models or, or processes do you have that you think are effective ways of of getting um, parent and, and community engagement and how could we learn from you? Because that's obviously a hot topic um, that we're constantly talking about. Um, what we've been doing um, this year are parent principal conversations and so we've had two um, in the fall we have another one coming up in February uh, late February which um, is going to be in partnership with Dave Courier and Eric Greenleaf around school safety um, and then we'll have a final one in April so parents are invited um, in the evening um, actually did a poll to our families and asked them what would you like to learn more about um, in at, about Pleasant Hill um, gave them just a list of topics and then had an other button um, and then decided the topics based on the parent input about what they wanted to know more about, um, which is why one of the um, topics is gonna be around school safety. So we're, we've done it four times, um, very well attended, great feedback um, from our families. They found it very valuable for their time, very short, 45 minutes, um, 5.30 to 6.15 um, in, the, in the afternoon, late evening. Um, so that's been a, a great way to get their input. And Diana, aren't you hosting a book we have a couple of things coming up so we have um, a book study anxious parent anxious child um, that our student advocacy group is putting on that's been part of their focus for their PLT work mm -hmm. this year and so we're really excited about that and then um, we're also hosting a cyber safety dialogue with parents um, we did that last year and it wasn't very well attended last year, but we're really looking forward to the, um, the hope that it will be well attended this year. We know that um, everyone in the community is really focused on um, how do we help our kids to navigate um, through all of the things that come along with having technology and personal devices. Anyone else want to share, Kelly? <laughs> well, well, the mic goes around. Do we have a way to monitor our success when we email or reach out to the teachers, I mean, to the community as a district? I know we talked about this a little bit in communications the other day, but... So, I happen to know that, um, like, for example, at the middle school, we send out uh, Friday family news every week. And it is possible for us to, through technology, monitor how many people actually open the emails that we send. And so we're able to um, have that data to track um, who's even opening it, right? And then obviously we, we can't know what they do once they open it, right? Like you might open it for two seconds, you might open it for 20 minutes. Um, but at least it does allow us to know um, what is the effectiveness of what that communication looks like. And also through um, our district Facebook page, we're able to see like levels of engagement and things that different types of posts get or that how many people are, re uh, how many people are clicking on it, how many people are sharing it um, or reacting to it. So we've started to look at some of those analytics as well. And in informal ways, you can tell by how many calls come into the office about <laughs> the question that was just answered in the family news the day before. So that is helpful too. Um, I was going to say that we've had a lot of success with parent engagement and doing like a twofer. So similarly, last year we offered the, our um, instructional coach in technology worked so hard to plan this incredible cyber safety event and truly less than 10 people came, um, which was a bummer, and so we reflected on that. Um, but what we've had success with is if it's 
like a family event that we're weaving in some pieces like that. So we'll host a literacy night and parents have opportunities to learn a little bit about some strategies that are being used in the curriculum and their kids have a great time doing these literacy-based activities. Or STEAM night and same thing. Parents are learning about our modeling that's in our math curriculum, but the kids are doing all of these, you know, incredible STEAM-based activities. So those have been some ways that we've kind of gotten the twofer for a parent engagement. Back to Ann Lovejoy. Uh, two things, one about the email and how you know, and I, um, the tricky part is that often you can open it on your phone on a mobile device and it doesn't show that you've opened it. So you have to be careful. You can't s assume that people haven't opened it because they may be opening it on a mobile device and oh. reading it and you just don't know. So don't, it's a lot of negatives when there may not be as many as you think. Like, nobody even opened this, but it doesn't always record a mobile, that's what I've learned. So that's a good thing. Um, and it, it does help us keep our email list clean because it tells you bounces back and those kinds of things, so that helps. Um, but uh, back to parent engagement and community engagement, the PTA at the K2 level, as mm -hmm. many of you know, is incredible. So they provide so many opportunities for the K2 community to come together, um, both in school and out of school and for kids and, and for adults. So um, that's another way that we we can really have a lot of engagement. And we're very fortunate at K2 because so many parents are eager to volunteer and be a part of the schools, whether it's once a week or once a month or once a year. Um, but that does keep, keep parents engaged and connected a lot in a way that may not happen at older levels. I, I have kind of a specific question because I noticed that um, a lot of the different buildings mentioned that um, it's harder to get what, um, feedback from ed techs because they can't attend a lot of the meetings. So, um, and obviously, you know, like I think who was saying, Anne was saying that, you know, they're really, really involved in our students, um, in our students' day. So, is that something that's being worked on, or like how, how are you, how are different buildings figuring that out? I think the, the biggest challenge is just the contract. So ed techs work a seven and a half hour day, but because they're providing so much support and coverage for the students, um, their whole day is consumed with supporting the students. And when staff <coughs> meetings occur, they're 90 minutes after school, but their day technically ends. Different for our staff because it's in their, con for people per on the professional teacher's contract, it's in their contract that they attend these meetings mm -hmm. where it's not in the ed techs. And so I think it just comes out, I mean, the ultimate solution would be to negotiate the contract accordingly so that they're compensated for that time in the way that teachers and other professionals are. Um, and the, 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 the transition really happened when we, the last contract was settled and it went to the two 90 minute meetings a month because they used to be an hour, I believe. And so ed techs would come for like the first half hour because that's still part of their seven and a half hour workday, but then leave in the middle of the meeting in some cases. So um, I think the ultimate solution comes from the contract, negotiating the contract in a different way. But I don't know if you guys have any Are there creative. workarounds that um, you're currently using? <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll start just quickly at K2. Um, it, last year we were able to have 30 minute ed tech only meetings before school because they started at 8.15 and kids didn't arrive until 9.50. This year, they start at 8.50, sorry. This year, they arrive at 8.15 and kids arrive at 8.30. So they're often starting to perform their one-on-one -on -one supervisory duties as early as 8.30. Um, and we just need far more supervision than we used to in the mornings. So that amount of time is completely gone. Um, I can speak for eight corners in the afternoon in spite of the fact that four of our five buses are pretty much at the building waiting for kids to get on them. By the time we get all the kids on the buses and let, wait for that one last bus, it's 3.35. So some of those ed techs have a few minutes after school to meet with teachers, but it's still, teachers yeah, can yeah. leave at 3.30. So um, it just, the timing is just not mm -hmm. conducive to meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and so we thought Wednesday mornings would be our solution, but um, that hasn't, um, panned out as well as we would like either because of PLTs and other, other opportunities that are awesome for them but that take them out of the building for specialized training 
Um, and again, it depends on whether they're special ed ed techs or library ed techs or building ed techs. There's a whole range of people in different jobs. But um, at the K2 level, it is a huge challenge. Um, and there has not been a successful work around it, at least in my building. And I don't want to, I'm seeing Kelly shake her hand. And Jess is in it. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. So Dave and then, why don't Dave you go and then. And yeah, then while you're passing the microphone around, at the middle school we do have monthly meetings. They generally will follow our faculty meetings. So not only do they learn what the faculty has done in the faculty meetings, but we also spot what the needs are for that specific group. And they do have a voice. They uh, are, uh, we have an open door policy that they could come and see us at any time. But we weave in uh, a meeting for each month. They are scheduled through the summer so that they have, uh, when they come to school, they have all of the scheduled meetings for the year. And again, we, uh, we go with the needs of our faculty, our, our, excuse me, our ed tech staff. And I do touch base with them throughout the year for needs for meetings. So we schedule meetings for the year, but I also want to know if something comes up. Is there a technology need that they need for professional development? Or is there something going on in the school that uh, a new program that they might need more information about? So we do have that voice, and we do have that professional development for our ed techs. And that's monthly within the school day. Thanks, Dave. Brent? Yeah, I would echo what, what Dave shared. Uh, we do the same at Wentworth, uh, following the faculty PD on the following Thursday. We do a meeting. And because of their schedule, they can come to the mo a morning session or an afternoon session. Um, and I, it's really about staying informed with what the faculty is doing. And I would also agree with Julie that if we can um, all be together to hear that message um, through the contract, that would be wonderful. We also have the ed techs participate in our PLT, our professional learning time and groups. Um, <coughs> they also receive the weekly staff news and they have a lead teacher, cooperating teacher who can keep them informed as well. Thanks. So I can talk about the high school a little bit. Uh, much like the other phase levels, we meet monthly with our ed techs. Ed and I do that. Um, much of it is information sharing regarding what's going on school wide. Occasionally, they'll have some needs or concerns or questions that they want to have us address that pertain directly to them, and we do the best that we can. I definitely have to give a shout out to Allison and Chris, who've been meeting with EdTechs more regularly this year to focus in, really focus in on some of their particular needs and their interests, and, and I'm grateful for that because we don't always get to do that. We try to when we can, so I think it operates much the same way. Th those half-hour meetings occur during the department meetings, and then after we're done around 3 o'clock, Ed and I head out to the department meetings. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's far more of a problem for K2. Um, I, I have a question for the middle school in particular. I, there, we've heard so many, I think, great examples of um, decision-making models that worked well, but um, the, the, I guess the example I would have cited before today would have been the, what you did in, uh, with the grading structure mm -hmm. um, this year. <laughs> and I mean, I've got to admit, it was such a surprise to me at, at how, how much work you did and how well it went given where we were um, last year. And so I know that that involved a lot of collaboration and, and cooperation with a, a number of different stakeholders. So I, I understand that that was sort of a somewhat maybe of a change, but I'm interested more systemically what what happened to allow that process to to be so beneficial. Was there was there some sort of change or or how, or structural change or, or how did that happen? I guess I'm confused about the root of your like how was that decision made to use that process? Well, I mean. I don't want to. I guess I'm trying to avoid calling last the the year before un, unsuccessful. So uh -huh. so, but but I mean, and that's fine. I wasn't the principal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take any offense. <laughs> so I mean, to, to me though, it just seems like such a, an amazing mm -hmm. thing that happened, and I just looked at the results and thought, you know, everybody seems happy. And so, how did it go from this one process where? 
you know, we all heard about the concerns and what wasn't working to, and, and I don't mean necessarily, well, I got the feedback, but how were you able to get that? Or, or what was the, what was the difference in leadership or in the structure of your school? Or how did that come about to for right. that change? Because that was so successful. I'm interested in mm -hmm. how you can duplicate it. Sure. Um, you know, honestly, in terms of like reflecting and thinking back on that, I think that um, we kind of just took that on as we've got a real dilemma here. We were getting a lot of feedback and we needed to figure out how do we really take into account all of that feedback. Um, I also happen to be in um, my doctoral program in public policy and so I was learning a lot at the time about how do you really think deeply about a problem of practice um, especially as it does relate to policy and really relied on thinking deeply about how what was the best most organized way to take all of that feedback into account um, and and talked with the building leadership team about what's, um, you know, what are some ideas that we could come up with in terms of how do we wrap ourselves around this problem in a way that we can really hang on to all of those pieces. And I would just echo what Diane's saying, bringing us back to kind of full circle the beginning. I think what the middle school did well was they involved stakeholders from the beginning. They said clearly, you know, when we implemented our new grading policies or practices, um, both at the middle school and high school, the plan was always to implement it, then get feedback as we go and decide, is this working, is this not? Do we need to iterate? Do we need to abort? Do we need to, you know? Um, so I think that they did a great job of getting their stakeholders involved from the very beginning and also being really clear about, here's what we're doing and why, and here's the timeline in which it's gonna be done. So that communication was great from the beginning. Um, and they took the time to build the trust. They used a neutral facilitator with Great Schools Partnership um, to help with some of the community forums or the, the forums that they had within their, um, with their teachers. And they were really honest about what the feedback said. It was shared out to the, the whole staff. Everyone mm -hmm. was able to see the feedback. It wasn't you know, cleansed or sorted um, in any sort of way. And then the staff, really, it was their patience and expertise in taking and giving time over the summer to say, OK, now that we know this is what our, our constituents need and want from us, what will that look like? And um, you want to add to that? Jill? Sure, and I would say that we also we've made a decision, and when we make decisions, we make a commitment. And even though we are constantly looking at, you know, this might not be working right now, or this, you know, here are some suggestions. We say we've made this commitment for this timeline, and we aren't going to change it until we get further. Because sometimes you can say it isn't working right now, and we can be quick to make decisions. We may change it, and then we find it was working, and so. We are not quick to make decisions. We really take in everybody's feedback in those decisions. We make our commitment. We stick to it, but we really still hear everybody. And um, those yeah. decisions are then made. And the other thing I would add to that real briefly would be, you know, um, as we made those decisions, there were individuals who might not have personally agreed with all of the decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we certainly heard feedback from individual staff, well, I don't agree with this piece or I don't agree with this element. But at the end of the day, we had to take a look at what is the overarching themes that we're hearing and we really need to stay true to that and set our own personal beliefs or agendas aside from that. And I think um, when we start taking a look at big policy issues, that's where things get really tricky to take our own personal beliefs and opinions and be willing to set those aside. Thank you. Attempting to solve a real problem, mm -hmm. and that is where you know when you when you go to that premise, what is the problem? And and policy can even be um, attempting uh, to solve problems, right? But sometimes policy is far away from. Sometimes it can be far removed from 
the real problems. And so for involving the stakeholders, that's how we determine what really is the problem that needs to be solved. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Can, Can I, I ask a quick one? Yes. Yeah. I promise. So I was really interested to hear from the primary school principals that part of your, part of your structure is um, meeting with the SEA building rep in your schools. And I thought that was really cool to see and kind of speaks to that culture piece that was talked about earlier too. It's a great way to, to build a culture and to build trust um, when you have those regular meetings with the, the SEA. I was wondering if, um, if that's true at the other phase levels, if, yep. that's, if that's a policy, because I, I, I might have missed it in terms of the, the structure. It's a so, common practice, yeah, that, Every, that's, yeah. that's great. Every building meets with their reps every month, and Joanne and I meet with the president and their executive leadership every month as well. <coughs> thank you. Okay. All right, again, thank you all so much for coming. Before we call for the adjournment, um, we invite you to stay. There's a light dinner, pizza, salad, as a thank you for all of the effort that you put forward, as well as missing your own meals with your family. So please do join us. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion, motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Okay. Unanimous. Again, thank you so much, and we'll be back thank in you. 25 minutes. What are you drinking? What are you drinking? Yeah. Uh, I keep smelling it, and I'm like, I'm
can see it. Call the meeting back to order for Thursday, January 17th. This is the business agenda for the Scarborough School Board. Um, apologize for the delay for the folks at home as we got ourselves back together. Are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? There are none. Excellent. 3.0, enrollment projection study update. Yes, um, at this time I'll introduce to you Rebecca Wandell. <clears throat> she is both a school employee, but in her other job, or her night job, she works um, as a consultant. And I'll let Rebecca introduce herself and tell you a bit about that. But we're grateful to have her here tonight and provide an update on our long range enrollment projections. <coughs> Hi, hopefully you can hear me with this here. <coughs> so I have been a public policy consultant for about 20 years. Previous to my employment with the Scarborough School Department, I worked for a small public policy consulting firm called Planning Decisions. There I was their enrollment specialist. Um, I have a degree from the Muskie School at USM and it's on st statistical analysis. So this is sort of a natural fit for me to do this and also work <coughs> at the school. I work at the middle school for those who don't know that already. Um, I have done Scarborough's enrollment projections multiple times. The last time was in 2015. Prior to that, I believe it was in 2010. Before that, 2007. So I do have some historical knowledge about what is going on with the enrollment here in Scarborough. Um, the model that is used was developed at my time at Planning Decisions. The reasoning behind it was there were so many school districts in Maine who were getting funding for building schools and finding out their schools were either underbuilt or overbuilt. So there was a real call for figuring out some long-term facilities planning as far as how many students would potentially be coming in. Uh, the previous model that they had been using didn't take into account birth rates, which is a big part of the study that I look at. That way you can see what's the pool of students that could potentially show up into your kindergarten, first grade, second grade class. Um, the sources of the data that I use, let's see, make sure we have, um, for set resident births, that information comes directly from the state of Maine. It is based on a calendar year, but I get the information by month. So as you know, students aren't enrolled by calendar year. They go from October to October. So I adjust that birth data to make sure it falls in the same timeline. We want to make sure we're comparing the same thing to the same thing. Um, where October is, I just get the month data. I just have to break that in half and split it into the two different time periods. The next set of information that I use for this study and what I typically do use on most studies is I get the October 1st count directly <coughs> from the Maine Department of Education. Part of the reasoning for that versus getting some in-house data that might be kept is when we're looking at millions of dollars for school construction funding, it's good to say, hey, this is the information that you have, this is the information that we have, everything aligns. Um, there are different types of enrollment, so when you're talking about enrollment, it's important to kind of understand which one we're looking at. Um, there is resident enrollment, and then there's resident <coughs> attending enrollment. Some of your resident students don't attend schools in Scarborough. Some of them go to charter schools, private schools, um, various different places. <coughs> I do focus on your attending enrollment, because that's what we want to see. We want to see how many kids are showing up here. Um, there's also some non-district students attending, not too many, but there are a handful in the district. Um, and then when we, I, I looked at the housing information as well, as part of, that, part of that study, I did get the information directly from the school department because that's not something MDOE could help me with. That part was looking at where the students are coming from in town. So I could look at the addresses and say, okay, we know where these kids are coming from. That's part of the, the multifamily housing that I looked at. So the next part was the housing data. That data comes um, from the, the planning, the Scarborough Planning Office. I work with the planner here to get all the information from him. Um, the multifamily project, pro, uh, project information also <coughs> came directly from him. We, we discussed which other projects we could look at to use for comparison purposes. Um, 
than the bedroom per unit, because I really wanted to find out, do the three bedroom units in town bring in more students than your two bedroom units? Sure enough, they do, a little spoiler alert there, but I got that information directly from the management company for each of the projects that we talked to. I gave them a call, JK gave them a call, James was the planner, and just said, you know, what's your, how many units do you have? How many units in three bedrooms? What are those unit numbers? So then we could look at addresses and say, oh, we know, you know, somebody lives here and somebody lives there. So that's how we used our comparison. Um, so those are the main sources of information that we used for this study. So the next thing I want to talk about is what has historical enrollment done. And I think that there's been a lot of discussion about how enrollment in Scarborough has declined over time. So you have your K-2 enrollment was around over the last 10 years. Okay, so it started at about 753 students. Over time, it has declined quite a bit. It got to about 2014 is where it started to sort of level <coughs> off a little bit. Um, the lowest enrollment was 581, and recently it's up to 608. So as you can see at the end of the <coughs> K-2 enrollment, it started to pick up just a little bit there. The 3-5 enrollment, same thing. It's, it went up actually in 2011, when was that? 2011, that's when the high enrollment was of the 776 students. But recently again, it's come back down, which isn't surprising as you see your K-2 enrollment had started to go down as well. So as those students start to move on, that level starts to move on to your K, your 3-5 school. Okay, so then I go to the next one. <coughs> right. So then looking at the middle school, the middle school hasn't seen that full impact of the down, the down uh, decline in enrollment that 3-5 has seen. Uh, it was pretty stable right through about 2014, and then it started to go down a little bit. And as we know, that 3-5 enrollment went down, so we will see 6-8 go down again in the future. 9-12 um, enrollment for high school, same thing. It's been a little high, but look, it's nice and it's been pretty stable over the last several years. 2013 <coughs> is about the lowest point there. Uh, nope, it actually says 2017 had the lowest enrollment still, it's been pretty stable over the last five, <coughs> six years or so. So overall, K-12 enrollment, you can see, it's gone from that 3,355 students in 2008, went down to 2015, it leveled off. The lowest enrollment was actually last year, according to the data that I have. Um, 2,933 this year, it started to peak up just a little bit. So 2,942. So sneak peek, what is enrollment going to do in the future? Well, that's what I'll talk about after I go through a couple of steps here, but yes, it, it is projected to increase. The amount of increase, that's the part that is yet to be determined. So as I mentioned about the model that I used, it was developed at my time of planning decisions probably about 20 years ago. Um, and we'll, we'll do that too. So the first step that we do when we look at the enrollment is get the resident birth figures, as I mentioned. And then we look at the first grade enrollment as the entering class size. The reason we've gone with first grade enrollment for so many years is kindergarten does have some variations. There in the past have been half day kindergarten. Um, obviously now it's more all day kindergarten, but parents would often say they'd send their kid to a private kindergarten because that's where their daycare was. There were all these different things that went on with the kindergarten class. So we look at the first grade as being the entering class. <coughs> so then we've, we've determined a ratio of in-migration or out-migration. That would be the difference between how many children were born six years prior to your first grade enrollment year. So if we look at, my little button over here, 2011-2012, there were 129 births, and then we go to our first grade enrollment that was in this most current year, 187. That's a really sizable in-migration. It gives us a ratio of 1.45, increase of 45%. That's high. There's not too many districts in Maine that see this. I see, I see it in, I've seen it in Falmouth, I've seen it in Cumberland, I've seen it in Yarmouth, I've seen it in Cape Elizabeth. 
I certainly have not seen it in Portland. I've not seen it in South Portland. I've not seen it in a number of the rural districts either. So Scarborough is a little bit different in this respect that we have a lot of children coming in into our community to go to school who were not born here. So be reasonable to expect that if this is what had been continuing in the past, this will continue in the future unless something happens to change that trend. So the next part of the enrollment study looks at the grade to grade migration. So that would be as that student moves from first grade to second grade to third grade to fourth grade and so on until they graduate. This table, I'm not sure if you can really see it, but I picked on the class of 2019. So back when they were in second grade, that class was 258 students. As it went down over time, it came to, or went up actually, it went to 286, 282, 289 when they were at the middle school. That class, as it moved on to the high school, then dropped down to 263. This is very common. You know, between eighth grade and ninth grade, that's where students start to decide, do I want to go to my local high school? Do I want to go to a private school? Do I want to go to a charter school? And more recently, over the last five years or so, there have been a great number of charter schools that have come into the area. So that's our, our ratio has gone down a little bit with those, those students moving out. But still, if we look at that class 2019, it's 266 students, still higher than it was back when they were in second grade. So they've still seen that in-migration of students as it's gone through time. <coughs> okay. So the next thing I'll talk a little bit about is our birth rates. So as you see from the little colors here, the gray is the birth births that have impacted our historical first grade enrollment. So that's where births have gone over, every, over the last 10 years that have been impacted how many students we have in. The blue is showing what's yet to come. So as you can see, the births were up a bit higher. You know, they averaged about 159 over that first five year period. So that was 2002 through 2006. And then the second half of that 10 year period, they went down to 135. And then more recently, over the last three years, they averaged 133. So that's 28 births fewer that we've seen in our community. And you know what that means, lower class sizes. Unless in migration increases that much more to take over what's been lost. So then looking at our future first grade, or first uh, births that will be impacting the future first grade. So over the last five years, it's 152. So that's gone back up again. More recently, three years down a little bit, 146. But that's still, we're, we're, we're back up uh, 15 more. So that the ex expectation would be, again, if our preschool and migration stays as it had in the past, we'll start seeing a higher level of, of first grade enrollment coming forward. Okay, so talking about the preschool migration trends. Just wanna look at what's gone on in the past um, the lower bar chart there kind of shows you a year-to-year -year migration. As you see, it, it goes up and down. Every year is a little different. How many additional kids do we see come in? But looking at the trends on the average, we see, okay, so it's all we, we've always had an immigration, just how much immigration have we had? First five years, 37%. It's gone up to, 30, uh, to 45 over the five year, down a little bit in the last three years, 42 but that's very, still very healthy in migration, especially considering some of the other districts I've seen. All right, again, first grade class sizes, averaged about 206 students on the whole. Uh, first half, much higher, 217, gone down to 196, and then 186 recently. That follows right along what I was saying about the birth trends. We've, even though we've had that immigration, we're still seeing that reduction in class size. Okay. All right. So next I'll talk a little bit about the grade to grade migration trends. These are the average trends in each of the grade levels. 
hopefully you can see the, the data. I tried not to put too many of these huge spreadsheets up because there's a lot of information and it's really hard to see. Um, but I can walk you through a little bit what it says if you can't read that clearly. So there were three different grade levels that saw a change in their average migration trends. The, those grade levels are your primary school. So your K1, 1, 2, and then 2, 3 into Wentworth have all seen higher levels of in-migration over the last three years. So what that'll do is start to bring up enrollment a bit more too. You know, we've had that reduction in births, we've had that steady in-migration, but we've also seen additional students come in in between. Um, the one that I saw a little bit less, grades four to five, the in-migration went down. It's almost no migration at this point. Still, we're not losing kids, but it's not as high as it had been in the past. Um, 10 out of the 12 grade levels see in migration. That's also unusual for Maine. There's you generally you see more than that. The eight to nine is the out migration. Again, not unusual. I see this district all district all over the place. It happens a lot. And then 10 to 11, there's an out migration. I have a couple theories of maybe why. Nothing substantiated, but you see the little bit of in migration happening and happening from your 11 to 12. I have a feeling it might have something to do with some of the kids graduating early and maybe changing from that 11th grade to being a senior suddenly because they've got enough credits they can graduate. I don't know if that's really the case, but I kind of have a feeling that might be what happens between those different grade levels. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. So this is saying 2018-19, which is our current school year enrollment projections. <coughs> yes. So you looked at birth rates and then said this is what our enrollment should be doing right now currently. Or I haven't gotten to the projections yet. Okay. I've been going over the historical stuff. Okay. So we'll, we'll get to that towards the end. And the only reason I kind of did this in steps only because there's so much going on with the housing. <coughs> I didn't want to say here's the projections yet until I go over that housing portion. So just the note here says completed January 2019. Should it be January 2016? Because that was when these projections were actually originally done and you're just reinforcing them here? No, the, that, these are based on this year's migration and the trends this year. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I, trying to remember which year I do the projections, I put in the school year. So I may have done the projections in 2018, but it's through for the 2018-19 school year. Right, right. So that way I'll know that's the base, that's the end year that I have that actual historical data for. Okay. That, that helps. Hopefully. So the next thing I want to talk about is our, our new housing development. Um, not every community sees an impact from new housing. Again, Scarborough was different in this respect. There are some other communities that have similar impacts, and I'm sure you can guess who they are. Um, Falmouth, Yarmouth, Cumberland see very similar impacts on their enrollment from any new houses built. Um, so the first thing I want to find out is what has development been like over the last 10 years? And then I want to say, okay, how's that development impacted enrollment? I want to make sure that you know what's going on there is being adequately accounted for. Uh, what impact will any future development, you know, is there anything else going on that's out of the ordinary? What's that going to do for your future enrollment? And then I want to make sure that the best fit model and the best fit, I want to clarify this too, the best fit does not necessarily mean that I say that that's the best fit. The <coughs> best fit is just the statistical correlations between trends. So it doesn't always adequately account for enrollment when it doesn't take care of other outside influences going on enrollment. But I want to make sure that that model actually adequately accounts for the changes going on in the community. So the housing <coughs> study portion. Got the information from the town planner. And oh, well you can read that because it is a lot of information in one little sheet there. But back in 2003, your, the development was going on was about 159 units. There was a growth ordinance put in place that put a max at 135 units for non-age restricted housing. I don't take any count into how many yeah, age restricted houses are built. That has no bearing on my enrollment, so I take that out of the mix. Um, 
But then quickly, if you look down to 2018, you'll say, well, hold on, there's 180 units there. Why is that over the 135? Well, there was also a pool of, re it's what they've been calling a reserve pool of permits set aside by the town council of about 500 permits. These were supposed to be permits for, for multifamily housing built in density zones. So they have issued a number of the permits. So there are still 283.5 of those permits left in that pool. The 0.5 comes from any unit that's a one bedroom unit and less than 700, 750 square feet only accounts for one or 0.5. So you can have two of those units for every one permit. That's why there's a 0.5. Um, so there's still a large pool out there. One of the things that they said, to, you know, <laughs> worry about what's going to happen with those. Right now, there are no projects that would fit under those 283 permits, with the exception of a handful of units left at the Beacon that can still pull from that. So that's one thing. If we look at the 2017 information, <coughs> what I used was 159 <coughs> units. There were actually 261 permits issued. 102 of those were one bedroom units. One bedroom units should not have any impact on school enrollment. Could a student potentially be in a one bedroom unit? Sure, but statistically speaking, it's low. It would be in the same as an age restricted housing unit. So in 2018, there were 180. One of the things about the two, uh, 2018 information is these permits were pulled, but doesn't necessarily mean that those units have been built. And if they have been built, doesn't mean that they have their occupancy permit, which has been the case with a two of the developments that I really wanted to focus on. Uh, we have two other new ones coming in, which can we talk about the next one? Okay, really quick sneak peek on that one too. Um, the Avesta housing project and then the <coughs> Beacon. The Avesta project, project has 38 units of affordable housing it's off Dunstan Corner area there. Um, there are 20 units, I believe, in that. I'll double check on that, that are, would actually impact enrollment. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Beacon, which has 288 units in it. And there are a number of those that are also one bedroom. Let me just check on so I don't give you the wrong thing. Becca, yes. quick question. Sure. If they pull those, if they pull those permits, how good, how long are they good for? Is like a five year that they have to have them built by? I believe so. That, okay. That's one of those that I think that the planning department could answer that one a bit okay. better for you. But I do know that there is a time limit that okay. they, they can build. I'm not sure that it's five years though. Okay. But with these, these have been pulled and they've mostly been, been built. built. Um, with the Beacon, they, some of them were issued occupancy permits after this, after the, all the enrollment data was counted. So someone might say, oh yeah, they're open, there's people living in them, but they weren't occupied, we didn't have that permit when our information was pulled. So those kids aren't even accounted for in any of this yet. Okay. Um, so the Beacon had, the Beacon actually had 102 of those single family, or one, sorry, one bedroom units. So okay. that still left quite a few units to be accounted for. 42 of them are three bedrooms. So that, that's going to be a, a big thing to watch going forward here. The beacon is off high, guess? Yes, okay, yep. It was called, what was it called? The gateway, I think it was called for a while, so some people might remember it as that, but it's the beacon slash the gateway, which I think it's, it's settled on the beacon. But. So here's just your trends for the housing units. You can see it was way high, went way down. If you look at the time period, um, that it went down 2008 through 2013. We all know recession at that time, everything kind of slowed down. Now everything has started to pick back up again. And this huge increase 2018, mostly driven by the multifamily units that have been added. Rebecca, which, um, both those lines in the key are solid? Yes, oh, they are? Oh, looks like okay, so that's one of those things that it came over. So the one that is dashed, oh my, it is solid, isn't it? Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, that would be the higher one, so it would be a five-year. So that the dash is dash. five-year? The dash is the five-year, okay. yes. Thank you. 
So here's the next thing I just kind of wanted to show because I like looking at this one myself. You see the birth trends, how it did this very similar thing to your housing development trends. Um, are the two related? Probably has more to do with economics, mm -hmm. but you see if one thing happens, so does the other. So going forward, the expectation would be as we see this go up on the housing, we're going to watch those birth rates. Um, obviously, 2018 is the highest. We don't have all of 2018 information in yet. And again, 2018 all not all built. So you'd see a lot of those babies start showing up in the data 2019 or so and on. But that's, I always find that an interesting one to say, okay, look, they kind of follow along with one another. So as I mentioned back in 2015 with planning decisions, we did a similar study where we wanted to find out what was the impact of different housing unit types. That particular study focused mostly on single family unit development because at the time that was what was significantly occurring. There were not a whole lot of multifamily units, so we did look at the impact at that time, but there wasn't a lot to go by because there really weren't that many in the community. So the big thing with this study is we wa wanted to say, okay, is everything happening as it did in 2015 or has something changed? So now in 2018, what's gone on for changes in multifamily development? And part of that was saying, all right, what's happening at the current multifamily projects that we have? So in conjunction with the planning office, we identified six different projects to look at as far as what's been brought in from enrollment from these different projects. Three of them had one and two bedroom units, and three of them had one, two, and three bedroom units. So that'll be kind of important as I get to the next phases to see what's been brought on by each type of different development that's happening. <coughs> so um, the different projects that we looked at was Vernon Woods that has 55 units, 40 are one bedroom, only 15 are two bedroom. Carrier Woods has 84 units, it's an even split, 42 and 42, the one bedrooms are discounted. Foxcroft, all two bedroom units, but that's 104 units. That's quite a few units in that. Uh, Coach Lantern has 90. There are 35 two bedroom, but 55 three bedroom units. <coughs> Meadow Woods, much smaller, but it has 32 bedroom and only three three bedroom. Um, the Oaks and West Oaks are technically considered two separate projects, but they're on the same road, so for the purposes of figuring out what's going on with that combine them into one and considered it one project. In there, there are only seven one-bedroom units, so there aren't too many that could be discounted. So a lot of that project would be bringing in school enrollment. Uh, they're 111 two-bedroom and 17 three-bedroom. So the next thing was to look at the actual enrollment to see where are your students coming from. Um, and if you can see the figures on there, I'm sorry, hopefully I'm big enough, but Burnham Woods, Carrier Woods, Foxcroft all had a much lower rate of students per unit. They ranged between 0.12 students per unit to 0.2 students per unit. When we looked at the projects that had the one, two, and three bedroom units, there were actually, it's 0.4 to 0.6 students per unit. Now, if we go back to that study that we did in 2015, you can see that overall, if we do an average between all six projects, it hasn't changed a whole lot from what that study showed in 2015. A little bit higher on average if we consider all of them. However, if we look at them separately, there is a big difference between the two. So that'll become important when you're looking at different projects going forward. What does that project have for units? Is it all one and two bedroom? Okay, so this is what we'd expect to see. Does that project have one, two, and three bedroom? Okay, then we need to look at this different option. Rebecca, are you aware of the correlation between what your findings show here and the what the town uses in terms of planning for impact? Yeah, the imp that one I'm not entirely sure, but I, I believe that they use averages, so they don't take into account the differences between the two different types of projects. 
So they would, I, I think, they use that point three six versus saying, okay, this project has one, two, and three bedrooms, so it would actually be 0.53. So there's a higher impact. So in the future, if beyond that Avesta project and that Beacon project, something else comes in with one, two, and three bedroom units, it would probably be prudent to look at the impact from that other, that particular type versus looking at something that only has one and two bedroom. Um, I, you know, as I said, that there were a couple projects that were discounted because they were one bedroom, as everybody always thinks, well, what about the, I think it's Eastern Village one, that was all one yeah. bedroom. What about the Dunstan one, one bedroom? So that's why I haven't really discussed those projects. They weren't really on the table to worry about enrollment from, however, if something happens where they start adding on something or something gets changed, and it might be a different story. Okay. So I already kind of spoiled this one. I've told you about the Avesta project and the Beacon project. But this is where we want to find out what's going to happen from these two, since nothing has come into play from them. Um, we look at the different units and say, OK, so each project, we take out those one bedrooms, and we have what's left to try to figure out what's going to be the impact from these individual projects. So I use two different scenarios to determine those impacts. The first scenario looks at the projects by bedroom type, but uses an average of all six projects. So I say, what's the average of the two bedroom impact from all six, and what's the impact of the three bedroom? Of course, there are only three to go by, but that's what it is. It is what it is. The scenario two, I look specifically at those three projects that are most similar <coughs> to the Avesta and the Beacon project. Granted, I don't have information on other affordable housing projects in Scarborough to go by for Avesta to see if there's any difference between that versus the Beacon. The Beacon's more of a high end. I think they've got a pool and a clubhouse. And a pet park. S is, and a pep, sign me up. Um, but that has all, it's a totally two different types of projects. So we don't have something similar to compare and say, is there something different between that type of project? We don't know. Mm -hmm. but. If we look at the high end, it could be as high as 106 students coming from that, the, the two of those combined. On the lower end, it would be about 84 students. And then that's when we can break it down by grade, grade level. How many would come into your K-2 schools? How many would come into your 3-5 school? And so on and so forth. So this next one, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it because there is a lot of information on here. But that gives that breakdown of how everything was calculated. So we looked at all the different, for primary, what's the ratio for coming in for scenario <coughs> one, what's the ratio for scenario two, and then what would be the by grade. Again, this is on, so you take a number and divide it by three. All of those students might be coming into your first grade class, and there's just a couple in kindergarten and second grade. We don't know. It's one of those things we're just going to have to figure out over time. So I would be looking at the multifamily impact on a group versus a grade if you really want to figure out how many students are going to be in those particular grade levels or schools. Um, since the Beacon project is not going to be fully built in time to have that October 1st enrollment this year, 2019, I cut the figures in half for this coming school year and said there wouldn't be a full impact on those units quite yet. But by 2020, all of those units will be built. They'll all have their occupancy permit. And I'm assuming by October 1st, 2020, we will be seeing a number of kids from the project, both. Rebecca, am I missing the Downs project in here? The Downs project. So that is not something that would be under the reserve pool. It would be under the growth permit cap. <coughs> so they could go no more than 135 units mm -hmm. to build what they have in there, unless there is a change made at the town level somewhere. OK. But does that get factored into the So that will be the, the next thing. I okay. talk about. So next slide goes on to, so how many units does our best fit, the best fit model account for? 
I didn't want to go in through all the tables because there's multiple of them with the calculations in there, but it's in the final report. But in the end, when I went through preschool migration with the um, best fit model and elementary migration, that model counts for about 90 to 132 units, somewhere in there. So what that would mean is if we do max out the cap at 135 with the Downs project, if that happens, we would need to add in some additional students on top of our multifamily impact. So the first thing I did was create that 135 unit model. Adding in those additional 5.6 students and then really tiny extra amount for elementary migration. And part of the reasoning for, reason for that is the best fit model is already starting to take into account some of these in migration mm -hmm. trends that happened over the last three years that I talked about previously. Those, that change that's happened recently with the in, in migration increasing. The other thing I did with the 135 unit model is bumped up the bursts a little bit because we saw previously that's what kind of happened when housing unit development was higher. Modestly, just a you know, cumulative two bursts additional for year two, four, six, eight. Just bumping that up a little bit over time. Then, the next thing, this is not included in any of the projection models because it's all based on unknowns. What would happen to the rest of those reserve pool permits if they were pulled? So remember, this is on top of the 135 max units that can be built every year. There are no projects in line other than the handful that need to go to the beacon. So estimating it is, is purely a guess, but it's more or less, okay, just for <laughs> keeping in the back of the mind, here's what could potentially happen. So as I mentioned, there were 263.5 units. I took out the handful that we know are going to the beacon. I took out another handful to account for one bedroom units, just estimating based on past, we've had about 26% of the units were one bedroom, removed them. So what would happen if 175 of those reserve pool permits were actually units that would impact enrollment and went through a couple of the different scenarios? If it was the lower end, if they were only one and two bedroom, you might see about 28 kids. If they go on the one where you look at all six projects and kind of look at averages, about 68. If it's one, two, and three bedroom, you could be looking at another 95 or so students coming into the schools. This again, like I said, not in any of the models. It's just more or less in the back of the mind. If this is what happens, here's what you could kind of expect. Won't be known until a project actually comes into play. But once it does, you should be able to use these ratios to kind of say, okay, here's, here's what we could be seeing. So we'll go back to the different models that I created. There are six. The first one being the best fit, just based on historical trends, doesn't take into account any of those additional housing units. Then there's that multifamily impact from scenario one. Again, that's using all six of the different projects that we looked at, two and three bedroom. You're looking at the difference between what's the impact of the two versus the three still. The next one, scenario two, again, one, two, and three bedroom did the same thing for the 135 units added model, and then added in those extra family impacts from that. So that should give a couple of different scenarios of where enrollment could go. I know that seems like a lot, but the thing is we are in such a change here in our district, we don't really know where this is going to go. Um, and a lot of this is driven by the multifamily housing units. So it'll be something over time you'll have to watch and see which, which one are we starting to follow? Are we starting to follow something in between? Are we going even above what we're estimating? Um, I don't wanna plug having to do this study again, but it's one of those, if things go off the rails, you probably will wanna revisit and see what's happening with the migration trends in town. So now I'll go over the projection part of it. So for future first grade class sizes, um, one of the things I will note is I don't start my, start my tables like at uh, 100. I know that makes it a little bit harder to see the differentiations between. It's one of those statistical things that kind of say, well, that I, I wanna see the trends on the whole versus up close because it can show you some pretty significant changes that really maybe necessarily aren't happening. 
But looking on averages, we're looking at our first grade enrollment averaging 218 students. That's just under the best fit model. That would be an increase of about 32 students from the last three year average of 186. So that first grade class size is expected to go up. Even best fit model, even if we don't say we're not gonna account for anything for multifamily housing. If we look at the, the more, the lower end of the multifamily housing impact, about averaging about 225, the high end about 227. So the 135 housing unit, again, does not take into account multifamily impacts, so that's one or 226. But if we start looking at, okay, that Downs project does max us out every year at 135, plus we have the Sebesta project, plus we have the Beacon project all online, it could possibly be 233, 236, somewhere in there. I did talk to the planning department, I want to mention this, and ask, what do we think with this future development? Do we think we're going to max out the 135? The answer was 50-50 shot. So it will be something that needs to be watched um, going forward. It is an unknown. So for the first grade class sizes, just shows a more detailed piece of information. Um, the highest level that would be projected would reach about 259 students. That's under the 135 unit multi flood <coughs> impact high. I think the lowest was in the 201 range. It's a huge difference. A lot of that has to do with births. So we'll look at uh, K through 12 on the whole. As we know, we talked about it going down. So what's the projection going forward? Well, in the past, about 10 years ago, it was 300, uh, sorry, 3,355. What's that going to look like 10 years from now if we follow one of these different patterns? Even under the best fit, <coughs> we go up 3,900, uh, 3,000, sorry, 94. If we look under the higher end, the 135 plus the multifamily impact high, we are getting close to what it was 10 years ago. So this is really why we need to be paying attention over the next several years to see where are things going. K through two enrollment, as you see it went down, it's going to start to peak up and then it will go down a little bit again. That time period is due to the bursts going a little bit lower over the last three years or so, so it'll be something that needs to be watched. This is kind of how our enrollment has gone over time, just up and down as the different demographics in the area. It's interesting when you look at those models, it seems like, so we've been there before. Yes. But we have all of this new development. Yes. And that, I mean, obviously our demographics in the community have changed significantly over the last 10 years as well with more senior population. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those, Maine has the aging population. Um, I didn't look at it in this study because the information isn't out there yet, but the 10-year de uh, decennial census shows mm -hmm. that fertile female population in Maine and pretty much across the state, except for certain areas, fertile female population is declining. When you have a fertile female population that's declining, that means fewer children, unless those fertile females you have left start having more children than the average. I know, the fertile female. <laughs> <should not specific. laughs> fertile female is... Like that data. I know, I know. And, and that's eight, 18 to 40, uh, 44. So we all know there's, there that. can be some out of that range, but that's typically de in demographics, that's what we look at, is 18 to 44. And then 45 plus would be considered non-fertile female. Um, another thing, can I make a comment? Um, another thing I think that's important to keep in mind while we're looking at all of this is that based on the developments that we know are coming, these students are, the K-2 students are not going to be distributed evenly across all three schools. Mm -hmm. These kids are going to be attending Eight Corners primarily and then some at Blue Point. Yes, and right. so that's mm -hmm. like really important to be thinking about in terms of our space and our resources like, you know, because we do have three buildings. 
Yeah, and the, the individual school paid through two enrollment is difficult because when I look at first, I don't know how many were born in your Eight Corners district versus your Pleasant Hill district versus Oak Point district. That's where your kindergarten pre-registration process really is important. So you can see how many are coming in. Over time, too, you could be tracking and say, okay, we had a registration of this and we actually had this. So you can kind of make that prediction, too, um, for each year once the process is done. So this would be a good time to put a plug out there for anyone who has an incoming kindergartner for next school year. You can go to our website and find information about pre-registration. <laughs> yep. Please register early. Pre-register yeah. early. Yes, and, and that way you can figure out how many are you going to have at each of these schools. I mean, it, you already know your current kindergarten and how they'll move to first grade and, and then first grade to second grade. But those kindergarten, you want to know what's going on there. on to the actual charts. So if we look at 3-5 enrollment, and you just see that <coughs> bubble, just keep moving. Um, it goes a little bit later into the 3-5 school, but it will start to go up. Um, even the best fit model is showing it being a bit higher than what we'd seen back in 2011. Uh, looks like so the high would be about 797 students in the grades three through five. That would be at that top area for best fit. And under multifamily impact, you could be looking at an additional 26 on top of that. So it would be over 800 students at your farmer school. <coughs> we'll go by that here. We'll talk about the middle school. And again, there goes that bubble. Keeps <coughs> moving on down. Um, middle school hasn't seen that full decline that has been seen at the K-2 and 3 <coughs> So we will have a few years there at the middle school. We'll, we'll still go down a little bit. That'll go through to about, let's see, what year 2023. that stopped. And, um, it looks like 2024, roughly. And then it will start, you'll hit those, that bigger class sizes start coming into the middle school. And then high school. High school hasn't seen any of this yet. So for now, the high school has been moving along pretty stable, a little bit lower last year, but it's that will start to see these lower class sizes that we've started to see coming into the middle school and 3-5 and K-2. So the only, where high school, we generally don't see these huge in-migrations as far as when you have new housing units built, not a lot of people move once they get to high school. But again, with these unknowns, this could change. So it's gonna be something you need to be paying attention to at the high school level to see if there are trend changes there. But then at the very end there, over 10 years, that's when that bigger little bubble starts to hit your high school. So I'll just move on to my recommendations. Um, in the future, I think everybody, it's really important to watch the birth trends, see what's going on, how many babies are born to residents of Scarborough. One of the things we're gonna see changed because we do have these multifamily units now come into play. They'll probably not be the same trends that we've seen in the mm -hmm. past. There's probably going to be some changes there. What those changes are are unknown. People don't move into multifamily housing generally and stay there for 16, 18 years until you know, there's students graduated. It does happen, but that's not typically what happens um, in multifamily housing. You'll need to keep a watch on the preschool and elementary trend, trends, just the same thing. See what's going on there. What patterns is it changing? Um, I would also recommend that there is tracking of where these new students are coming from and that could be the same information that I had pulled to, for this report just on the same time period every year see where they're coming from put I have all the addresses just so you can say okay a lot of students are suddenly coming from this housing project or this housing project or this new single-family development that's come in um, and then lastly really need to watch the housing trends see what's going on. Are we gonna max out at that 135? Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen with that reserve pool? Um, 
Are they going to change anything else? <laughs> we don't know. In terms of the, the birthing trends, are you also able to access other demographic information, such as like socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, gender? I believe that information is on the Vital Statistics website or can be requested. Sometimes it isn't there only because of the size of the demographic that mm -hmm. if they gave out the information, it could compromise privacy. So it's one of those things you would have to check on to see what level of information would be available. Um, the birth data is based on the mother's place of residence. So if the father lived in, say, Portland, that baby would be shown as being Scarborough resident. So there are little things like that. <coughs> Keep in mind when you're looking at the birth data. We had a uh, wonderful preview of this uh, last week at the first Long Range Planning Committee, Long Range Facilities Planning Committee. There's a lot of letters in that one. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I want to thank you for presenting it again here. But one thing I would add to this that we discussed at that meeting that I'd like to share at the, with the full board is that there is an, another unknown we haven't talked about yet, and that is the, the um, economy. Yes. and what may or may not be coming in the economy, which of course can't be in these charts because we have no idea what's going to happen, but anyone that's plugged into the fiscal world knows there's a lot of discussion right now going around about a, a correction, I'll call it that, um, that may be coming or may not be coming, but certainly that will play into this. Some of those single family lots could go on built on, but then our multifamily units that are going up could see a lot more semi-permanent residency if, if mm. people have to make that adjustment in their lives because of the economy. So it's another thing we'll have to keep our pulse on, but um, luckily the model you've created is flexible enough that we'll be able to, I hope, use it and, and um, shift the lens a bit. So thank you. Yeah, and that was the idea, to kind of give you some different scenarios and then we can see what happens. And I forgot to mention, I am a Scarborough resident. Um, I also have three kids in the school system, so I, I'm always here, but I'll be watching as well mm -hmm. just to see out of professional curiosity as well, what's going on. Well, and in your binder that Kelly Johnson prepared for you tonight, you have this current study in its entirety. Um, you also have the previous study, which for me has been like a Bible. I've, I've used this and you know put the analysis on our website and then compare our monthly enrollment data to what these numbers, and it has been really plus or minus a few kids right up until this year is where we started to see the discrepancy, which is the why behind us re-engaging Rebecca in, in this update. Um, and I, I'm curious to see how this will play out over the next couple of years, but also wondering if you could give us some, some pre-K projections. So if we did have four-year-olds, um, just with all the conversation happening around universal pre-K, not that we have space for that at the moment, but what kind of numbers would be would be looking at if we were to offer it? Um, I don't know if you can. Yep, based on other districts, that. and it's been all over the board depending on the district. It's in communities that have greater space; it's much higher. Those some are limited; they can only take so many. Mm -hmm. But generally, it's been somewhere between 60% to 70% of your K enrollment has been pre-K. So that's that's actually in Scarborough. That's a pretty high amount. <coughs> and that is all I have. The only thing I would recommend beyond that was just keep watching the projections, keep seeing if there's any need for any sort of revisit to the study, not that I'm planning having me do all this again, but it's one of those things that's just the nature of projections. You need to keep, keep watching on it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this was okay. a Thank you. super comprehensive. Um, <laughs> very comprehensive actually and from, coming from somebody who likes data it's incredible how it was laid out in a way that it made sense to everyone so thank you Good. For that. oh you're welcome so just one i don't know if this is putting you on the spot but of all of these different models is there one that you know if you were on the planning committee or if you were on the board um, or if you were the superintendent you'd be like that's the one to go by or do you yeah, I do have a preference <laughs> a towards one. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's putting me on the spot. <laughs> I like, personally, I like the best fit plus the high multifamily impact because I feel like that really shows a good level of development. I think we'll still have high development. I don't know that we're going to necessarily hit that 135. I think the um, 
downs project is going to keep it high unless we have a huge correction of some kind. Uh, but it also takes into account units that are very similar to what's being built. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I prefer personally that one. So that's table in the appendix, it's table 13B? That sounds about right. Yes. Yeah. Wait, which one did you say? The best fit plus plus? High. The multifamily yeah. impact high. high. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? I actually have one question, and I'm not sure if it's more for you or just long-range facility planning, but how do the projections here compare to what the capacity of our schools and classrooms like kind of look like in the future? Um, the projections here and what the like what we us? have here compared to what we should oh. be like I filling our classrooms with. Well, I can, I I the only thing I'd say from a planning standpoint is that we talked about this at the first planning committee meeting is that a lot of these at face value, looking at just the numbers, the actual head counts and stuff looks like we could handle it because we handled it before. Yeah. The challenge is, is that we're using space in a very different way these days than we have in the past. There's a lot more services that were required and, and happy to offer to students than we had even 10 years ago. So even though on paper, with the numbers, it looks like these schools can handle these numbers, I think we'd be challenged given the level of service that we offer to our students today. That's my, that's my yeah. answer. That's very well said. Yes, okay. very well yeah. said. Because I was looking at the enrollments in like 23, 24, and knowing what the capacity of some of our schools were, but then I took into account some of the pro programs that we have developed over the years and mm -hmm. the space that they've taken. The types of equipment that students need and um, the, the really range of abilities we serve within our schools. And I know at the middle school, when they were at, eight, <coughs> say, 840, we had um, the Passive Aquati plus 12 portables in the back, which they don't have today, the ones right. in the back. Well, and I would assume that it depends on the distribution of those numbers. Like, right, I mean, you know, we can, we can handle it at the high school in Wentworth maybe, but not necessarily at the K-2s. Right. So depending on how those numbers are all distributed could be problematic and then the last thing that you have um, in this binder just because I thought you would all like to look at as much data as you could get your hands on um, is a report that was done um, by the central office leadership team or at the recommendation of the central office leadership team prior to my arrival but I know it's been a really important document for me and getting acclimated to you know, what we're spending per pupil and what our funding looks like comparative to other districts that we aspire to or that um, sort of look like us. And so this report is, is out of date, but it's a good historical knowledge. And I believe one of our community members who's here tonight, John, um, has been working on trying to, well, I know he has, been working on trying to update those numbers for us. So I have I've seen a draft of it, but I haven't had a chance to dig in. Um, which is something that Monique and Kathy have asked, you know, it's kind of John's um, expertise and support in because it's something that we've been wanting to do and just haven't had the time um, and resources to do it. So thank you, John, for volunteering your expertise and helping us with that. So, sorry, so you're just going to continue this, like, like right now it ends at 2016, was it? 15. 15? So you're going to go from there right? to continue yes. it? Hopefully. By we, I mean John. Um. <laughs> Will all of these materials be available on our website? Yes. Great. Thank you. When you say um, that we need more space per student now than when we have in the past mm -hmm. because of um, programming needs, mm -hmm. are you talking about special educational services? or One, one of the things, yeah. Yes, that is, is that primarily what well, you're talking about? Another example, and we, the Long Range Planning Committee met at Eight Corners, mm -hmm. um, and then afterwards we did a building tour. So just another like quick example would be um, there have been times when the students have had a shared multi-purpose room for music and art, whereas now they have a separate space. Um, but they're so good about being flexible with the building that they you know, do make shifts and changes like that based on their enrollment numbers. Um, but primarily, um, 
you know, they are they have cre they have needed to create a lot of um, specialized spaces um, in the buildings that weren't necessarily something that was available to the students ten years ago. And a couple other examples would be, I mean, just to piggyback on what April's saying, anytime you put a program on a cart, you're compromising the effectiveness of that. I mean, the difference between a music teacher who has a classroom to, to hold their class and the amount of movement that's able to happen, um, the types of instruments the students are able to be exposed to is really different than if they're pushing a cart into a classroom that already has a bunch of other furniture that's more academically focused. And the same would be true for art. You know, the difference between having an art room with drying racks and, um, you know, I would say proper sinks, but they don't have those um, in, in the K2s. But just the sheer space of being able to have long, you know, long-term projects over time is really near impossible when you're pushing a cart into a classroom with some supplies. So those are some of the decisions that we'll have to make as we think about, you know, what do we value in terms of quality of programming? Not to mention just we can add a couple more teachers, but that's a couple more cars that need more parking spots, and we know. I think everyone has experienced the challenges with the parking um, at the smaller schools and in the middle school as well. So those are other things that sometimes it's, you think like, oh, well, there's a room. Let's just put 20 kids in there. Well, how many adults do they need to support them? And, you know, what, what's sort of the ripple effect of that? Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you to all of our administrators who have um, stayed through to hear that report. As you can see, it's a, a hot topic for all of us, and we, we watch it closely, particularly at budget time when we're trying to plan for next year. So thank you all for extending your day. Yes, thank, um, you. thank you. Please go home if you Knock would like. Out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, we need you tomorrow. Yeah, there was an adjustment to the agenda. Um, 4.0, public comment on the agenda. So we added that in. Are there any comments to be made on tonight's agenda? Okay, seeing none, um, 5.0, planning school board presentations and workshops. Okay. So um, this agenda item was added at the request of one of our school board members. Um, we were gonna just take a moment to go over the document that you all should have received ahead of time with your packets. And I'm trying to pull it up here quickly because I didn't shrink it. Um, I can project it as well. That's okay. I'm going to try that. Thank you, though. So if you remember, we had, um, by we, I mean Holt and myself, had pulled together a um, sort of outline. This is the what's on the wall in the conference room where we often meet. Um, is a chart paper with sticky notes that we move around and they're critical topics that we know um, we typically expose the board to each year. Um, so curriculum updates, technology updates, facilities updates, and um, just took it off of the wall and put it into a Google document so that you all could have access to it right at your fingertips anytime, anywhere. Um, and the idea behind this was to just map out um, some of the ways that we can both build your knowledge base but also um, get staff involved in coming and connecting with you all as we know it's a priority. And so, let me see if I plug in here if it'll project. Um, do you want me to do it? Do you have it right there? Okay, sure. <clears throat> Sometimes it gets weird if I do it over here. Um, and so really I think that the intent of adding this to the agenda was just to have a public discussion about it. Is that accurate, Amy? Yeah, I, I think I think it's helpful as as we start to um, participate in making future agendas. It's helpful to know what is already kind of on the docket, sure. so we're not inundating. And and then just kind of seeing this, we can see what's here and and what maybe we wanted to add. If anybody wanted to talk about adding a workshop idea, then it's an opportunity to do that. Yep, that sounds like a great idea. And so while Kelly's pulling that up. Um, if you want to search it, Cal, it's just called Presentations and Workshops, or School Board Workshops and Presentations. There it is. I see it, like, five down on your list. So I'll talk about January 1st, kind of reflecting, since we just experienced that, and maybe that'll help us think about how things go in the fo move forward. 
Um, this document is divided into two columns, um, well, four columns, month, date, workshops, and then business meeting presentations. And what we've really been trying to do over the past, I don't know, Joanne, 100 years, um, <laughs> is differentiate don't. between what is a workshop topic and what's a presentation that just happens at a business meeting. Um, and that was really feedback that we had gotten from past board members who said, you know, when it's a workshop, but then someone just stands up and gives a presentation, you know, does that, is that really the best use of a workshop? Because workshops give us less structure like we had tonight. We were able to have, I don't know, 40 some people here, um, which is, and, and it's a dialogue, which is really different than a presentation, which is, you know, technically a bit more formal. Um, and so we have, you know, our typical meeting, two meetings a month, and recently we have uh, read our policy about our meeting schedule at, um, through a different lens, thanks to one of our community members. And the way it actually reads is that a business meeting will occur on the first and third Thursday of the month, and workshops will occur on the third Thursday of the month. So we're interpreting that as the workshop can happen before the business meeting, but we still do business both on the first and third, much like we did today. Um, and so that has allowed us to invite more staff because they're not here so late at night after working a long day. Um, and it's also allowed us to kind of sneak in more Work, presentations and more work, um, which I think is a win-win all around. So in January, you all had a workshop from 6 to 7 where um, MSMA came out, right, mm -hmm. and talked to you about the superintendent search process. And then at the business meeting, that's where I talked to you about the new state report cards, which, by the way, we don't know when they're coming out. So um, I just checked in on that today. Still, or, I mean, I'm sure they will eventually, but... Delayed um, for a long time. <laughs> we'll, we'll be patient with that. So then the 17th, which is now today, we had the big decision-making workshop. It was so great to have so many principals and teachers um, and directors here. We had talked about also doing a workshop um, on the district curriculum action plan, and Monique <coughs> was going to present on that. But once we saw how much time we would actually need, it felt like that would be too much to do. So this obviously is going to need to get moved to a different time. What we were thinking also is that we would have long range facilities, um, a long range facilities update with the director of facilities, Harriman, and the aroma and demographics. After seeing how comprehensive Rebecca's report was, we said, let's chunk this out. That seems like too much to process in one, in one session. Um, and initially we had mapped out that this would be the time based on what the board had done with their self-assessment where you all would begin starting to talk about your self-assessment. That needs to happen, so maybe that gets moved to next month. Um, so you can already see that this is a very living, it's a living, breathing document. It needs to be fluid and flexible as our needs shift and change. Um, to Amy's point, I'm sure there's things on here, things that are not on here. Um, the, so my suggestion would be either to put this back to committee to kind of suss out you know, what are the order of things, maybe get a, a brainstorm a list tonight of different things, and then um, you know, try to try to piece it together, puzzle it together, mm -hmm. and either whether it's the communications committee or it's the policy committee, um, I don't think it matters which committee works on that. But that would be my su su suggestion. Based on what we just heard, are there workshops now that people are interested in adding? Is this something you want to take back and provide feedback on? How would you like to move forward with this? I have one topic I'd like to propose. Um, after what we heard tonight with, with all the administrators and teachers here, I would like to have a workshop topic where we can discuss ways for us to be more uh, involved directly with the schools, to have more direct contact with the teachers and the administrators, because it sounds like that's what they want. And, and mm -hmm. to be completely transparent, that, we, that didn't seem like that was really the direction we wanted to go after our original orientation materials from MSMA. But I'm really hearing that the community and the cultural context wants us to step outside of that more kind of um, conservative role. So I would love for us to have a workshop to talk about ways that we can do that because certainly we don't want to overtax our teachers or our principals. We don't want to unnecessarily take their time, but we also don't want to be um, too stoically conserved so as to look uninterested in what's going on in our schools. So I, I really think that could be something we could work out in a workshop. Great. I, I think also um, just it was 
brewing in my brain when we were talking with everybody that that's something that communications can come up with like some ideas mm -hmm. that we can then um, bring to the full board and discuss and um, I mean so I don't know if we want to do that first and then kind of all go through everything and um, I think that's a great idea refine it yeah. or add to it or take it take away or whatever I think starting a workshop yes. uh, starting a committee makes a lot of sense yeah. and then okay. coming to a workshop makes yeah thank you because yeah, technically you are the communications and outreach I think is the second that's our right. full name yes Perfect. Well, and, and we heard very clearly that they were excited to engage with us, right. and they were very appreciative and wanting that continue to, t to develop a culture and a right. climate that mm -hmm. um, that they would like to see here in the district. So I think it makes sense to do that. I also think if you look at our um, the board operating protocols on on the, the main page, being it talks about our ability to be in contact with the staff and to talk to the staff. So I don't think that it's really a violation of, of being able to do that. I think, of course, we can do that. Um, oh, of course, yeah. yeah. I, I just want to be careful that we aren't surprising people. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, jumping out from behind a bookcase right. or something. Hey! <laughs> and that, well, and I think with a purpose, that it's not a right. Right. open this up and, you know, what did you not like about the breakfast that was served today? I think we need to go in with mm -hmm. a plan. Um, and make sure that you know we're working with building administration to go in and do that again not just surprise attacking somebody of hey we're here for our, you know a one-on-one -on -one with whatever faculty member and if I Absolutely. could just reinforce I believe Alex guidance was that you can't just one off like go rogue and be like I'm gonna spend the day at Wentworth right. um, it has to be a strategic well you know communicated um, contact or you know communication or forum or outreach or right. however you decide to do it well look similarly in terms of what you guys did with the budget conversation mm -hmm. you know beginning that budget conversation with teachers and having a couple of members going yeah. down to the schools and and providing that mm -hmm. opportunity for them to come and speak about their budget priorities mm -hmm. I mean they I mean they really appreciated that mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I heard That's anecdotally from a, a lot of people that they like that but then I think here yeah. it was mentioned a couple times for sure mm -hmm. so there's some that's something they'd be added on to but that was you know, that, that's something that we could continue with, with other specific topics that maybe aren't necessarily the budget. Um, something I would love to add in, we've heard a lot about cybersecurity. Um, we talked a lot in policy about the issues with the vaping, um, whether it's tobacco products or non-tobacco products that are being vaped. Um, it would be interesting to have a set, a workshop on that. Mm -hmm. um, not only as parents or providing that information to our parents, but what actions can we as a board also adopt or take to help provide safety and security for the students? I think that's a great topic to have a workshop on. Um, today, Joanne and I made a connection with day one. We, we have connections with them, but just reinforce that connection. And they um, offered to work with the board on um, updating substance use policies generally or because um, I, I had shared with them that you all were working on the tobacco policy mm -hmm. and so they do that work they come out and they can either do it in a workshop form in a really public way which is a great way to expose our community to mm -hmm. the variety of supports and resources that they do um, or that they have and then they also can help with thinking about our discipline policies such as you know suspension um, or expulsion and what are some alternatives to that and so that can really drive some progressive policy development as well. That's an area too where I think we can really leverage the community. I know there's some people in the past who have spoken out about wanting to participate in those types of um, conversations mm -hmm. and, and so I think that would be a good opportunity to open it up to a broader um, conversation. I agree. Okay. It's a great workshop topic. I think too like ideally what I would like to see is I mean, we're, we're having this discussion, I mean, and so this sort of comes from a lot of the, um, earlier at the workshop, a lot of the schools talked about having these like open agendas where anyone could add to it at any time. And I'm not suggesting that necessarily, but I am saying that if we have this type of list of, you know, what Colt has asked us for, um, mm -hmm. that it could, and like you said, it's a living, breathing document. These things get changed and moved and switched all the time. but. 
Um, if we can incorporate just having a running list of interesting, you know, mm -hmm. interesting topics and um, whether if they are timely, you know, add that in too, um, that we can just reference and kind of check things off as mm -hmm. we go um, and get some feedback from um, the administrators and teachers saying, you know, asking like, what are some topics that you would like us to know about also? I mean, so mm -hmm. I think we can um, try to absorb a lot of different opinions on what might be a good workshop topic. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, w I wonder about um, a workshop to kind of talk about um, the, the bullying policies and the procedures and the protocols and, and how we how we're interacting with that. I mean, this, this is a law that, like, was 2013 for implementation, if I remember right, and, and then the um, schools worked on um, getting the compliance done with all the, the, the forms and, that they had to do. And, and I know our policy will be um, July of 2017, so it'll be two years this July that our, that policy and all those procedures and protocols were, were in place. Mm -hmm. Would this summer or maybe late in the school year, would that be a really good time for us to kind of review how that's going? Mm -hmm. And um, an opportunity to perhaps engage the community in terms of how, you know, understanding that this is, this is a community-wide issue and how can we work together to, to help with this issue in the schools? I actually think that's a great idea, especially as we start looking towards preparing for next year. Mm -hmm being able to have things ready for perhaps a handbook or in preparation of you know next fall that any changes are understood and adopted. Right. Well, if and it's going in the handbook, though, it doesn't have to be ready in the spring. But I don't think there's any new policies that uh, we adjusted our policy in July 2017 because there was a new model policy from the DOE mm -hmm. um, in 2016, and our previous policy was 2013 or 14. Right. Um, and so I don't see any new policies coming out, but I think that would be a great presentation. And then mm -hmm. even brainstorming, this kind of gets into another agenda item, but what kind of community dialogue or community forum might we want to host or promote? Um, I know, I think it was Gorham who recently did some sort of um, bullying, I don't know if it was a workshop, but they had like an outside group come in um, and it was for parents and students. Um, board members, obviously, and staff. So that could be yeah. kind of brainstorming some different ideas. Right. And I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that we need to change those policies. I think those policies are sound. Mm -hmm. I think they're very good. I think they're modeled after what the, the Department of Ed um, wanted in terms of state law. Um, it's just, you know, it's, the, you know the, it's hard. To, like, it's such a hard issue, and I, I really feel for the, the schools and the teachers mm -hmm. in terms of trying to manage this this issue in the age of social media and stuff that happens outside of the schools that filters into the schools. Mm -hmm. So, just an opportunity mm -hmm. for us to dialogue and talk about, you know, how is our policy working in its implementation? What's working well? Where can we improve? How can we engage the community mm -hmm. in helping us with this issue? I do like the idea of it being a um, living and breathing document. I believe it's on the share drives. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe underneath we have a list of add things in as they come up. This shouldn't be an exhaustive moment. Doing of that as we speak. Beautiful. <laughs> um, you know, really just making sure that we're using the drive in the most effective way, right. and then being able to pick off items um, as they're in there. Mm -hmm. And I think being able to distinguish. Um, that's that's a workshop, and that's a, yeah. a meeting, mm -hmm. you know, because... Cal, can you scroll up a little bit? <coughs> and so you all have access to this and can type right into here, so, I mean, scroll down. <laughs> so the page goes up. Other way. Other down. Is this on the share drive now? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Here's where I just started breaking it down based on what I'm hearing you guys saying, but feel free to edit or add to um, right in this document. We need to reschedule some things too, like the school board self-assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I don't know who's ultimately responsible for that, but Julie, is that when it usually happened? Like, is that yeah. the, the self-assessment? Is that when it usually started? In so. Um, 
last year in August, I'm trying to think, the maybe July, the school board chose to pilot a new self-assessment tool because they hadn't used one re in the recent past, but they had done some different things in the long ago past. Um, and so the four member board conducted the self-assessment. Um, Mary, as the chair at the time, consolidated the data or shared the data. Um, and then we attempted to use that as a tool in driving our goal setting. Um, the way that the timeline is outlined, outlined and I can share that, that tool with you all as well, um, or Leanne and Hillary can, um, it says that in January, every year, the board would do a second self-assessment. So you're doing it twice a year and sort of checking in and saying like, this is where we're rating ourselves now, particularly since we have new members in November um, every year. And then you can say, do, do our goals still align to where our, where our areas in need of improvement are? And so you kind of use that tool in helping you, you can use that tool in helping you set your goals, which is something that still needs to be done. There are no school board goals currently. Right. So as far as the doing that self-assessment as like a mid-year check, it's kind of tough to balance on what, how are you doing when you don't have a goal in place? Um, which really does tie into the next future item about having that board retreat. Um, but I do think we need to determine, and that may come out of policy, the self-assessment tool moving forward that would be used, um, ensuring that we're getting that done quickly so that we can get this in front of the board in order to get all of that process underway. Mm -hmm. And you can... You can still you the the thing that's unique about this assessment tool and it's modeled after New York State um, and and also they use it in RSU twenty one and they just adapted it basically put their letterhead on it so we adapted it put our letterhead on it um, but it's about the whole board you're not rating individuals you're saying as a collective how do we function and I think that's really important data to capture early on that baseline mm -hmm. data so that you have, you're able to celebrate how you're coming together and how you've grown as a board. Mm -hmm. um, because naturally, I already see how you're coming together and growing as a board. So I would say capture that data sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Well, and maybe, like you said, the next agenda item is the retreat, but um, maybe at a retreat where we're, we start talking about some norms and protocols that mm -hmm. will um, just give rise to some natural goals that might go along with that. Are we are we allowed at the retreat if we have if we schedule a retreat are we allowed to talk about goals there because it's public so it, so that could be a good opportunity for us to to look at what our goals are. Mm -hmm. as That's we're doing typically goals. where you set your goals is at at some sort of retreat because it's a pretty intensive right. process um, and just with the time constraints we had um, last year, Mary and I had tried to look at all the data and create some goals for the board to poke holes in. <coughs> Um, but that wasn't favorable to all members, so it kind of stopped there yeah. at that point. What about the diploma? Uh, issue. Say more. Sorry, I'm okay. losing my folks here. Um, <laughs> well, do you mean as a workshop? Discussing that as an issue, I mean. Yeah, I asked that exact question of our acting commissioner this morning. Mm -hmm. um, where where are we with diploma laws? And it was about as clear as mud, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, I didn't get any more clarity or any sense of a more specific timeline. Um, but when do so, we as a board need to make a decision for the high school to be able to like carry through with that? For well, I, well, we have a policy currently. Um, and the law is still in place. Like, the law did not go away. I know some people think that that's what happened. That's, that's not what happened. Um, what was just introduced was that this other um, bill that talks about the two different choices, which is that side-by-side -side document that I've shared with all of you, um, clarified that again today. You know, should, is there actions that our school boards should be taking currently based on what we know? And the recommendation is no because we don't know what we don't know yet. And so you would be making a decision, possibly changing um, graduation requirements without having rules to know what that means. And so right now, it's very clear our students earn credit to get their diploma. They know how many credits they need to earn based on what grade <coughs> level they're in. Um, I don't know how you could change that at all for our class of 20, 
19, obviously, or 2020, um, because they, they've been progressing through high school with a very clear understanding of what their graduation requirements would be. Um, and then now you have your current freshmen and sophomores who also think they know what their graduation requirements would be, are, I right. should say. Um, and so if we change that, it could, without knowing, in fact, what the, the law is going to say, we could right. be So can I just clarify, deficit. this is like off topic, because I know we're supposed to be talking about workshops, but can I just clarify, if we are interested in keeping a credit-based diploma, we don't have a decision to make. I mean, that's currently what we, we have. We have a credit-based okay. diploma currently, yes, for all students. But the difference in the credit requirement is different for the freshman class here. When you look at the program of studies, it goes from 21 and a half to 24 and a half. And for the sophomores. And for the sophomores. Yes. So that is different. That is really um, more to do with our schedule than it is to do with mm -hmm. any law that's out there. When we transition to the eight period alternating black schedule that allowed students to take more classes. Right. So that's why we upped the graduation requirement. Um, that has nothing to do with proficiency-based diploma versus credit-based diploma. We still have a credit-based diploma. Now the one thing, how we define how they earn credit. Is different in the program, yeah. So, right, right. And so that's the, that's the piece. So is, is, and we've had this conversation with the high school, and um, so I don't mean to be like creating any spoiler alerts, but if shouldn't proficiency be the same thing as passing a class? You know, that's like a question we've been asking of mm -hmm. ourselves. Why would we try to communicate those things in two different ways? Um, and I'm anticipating that that's going to be a recommendation coming out from the, the work the high school is currently doing. And so, so we will definitely have a workshop on that. Okay. We, yeah. That was <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Can you tell me about the diploma? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, the, re the only reason why it's not on here is because we weren't sure on timing of okay. when, but I'm going to stick it down here below so we don't forget. Yeah. Thanks. We should do a chart so we can check stuff off. We could do this. <laughs> Just like strike through it. Yes. If, if those who like to cross things off on lists, right? And it doesn't go away. All right. Are we good with um, the presentations and workshop section? Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. do you. Just before you check that off, do you all want to decide collectively how to move some of the things that are on here currently, or do you want that to go back to some sort of committee? Or? Do we have access to that? Yes. yes. Sure. It's in the it's on the drive. Drive. Oh, it's in the I think that should go back to the committee. That's I can't find it. I don't okay. think we all need to be here with our calendars. And no. Okay. okay. Which committee? I don't know. Excellent question. Um, <laughs> whichever, I mean, I don't think. Never a committee to begin with. It's, I was going to say, it actually comes in under the agenda setting. So yeah. I think it's pieces that would go there. And okay. much like tonight, if there were items that people want to add, it's as simple as sending a note saying, please add these items. Mm -hmm. And they're added to the agenda. So we can work through those pieces. Um, if, as we're going through, when the agenda comes out in advance, if somebody says, I really don't think that workshop is appropriate now, I'd want to move it to something different. As long as we have enough time for the staff to create their pieces, if we have any staff requirement, we can modify that before the agenda is printed. I mean, we're getting it out pretty early in the process. But I think there's stuff that already has to be moved from January because we didn't get to it. So what committee is going to decide when that gets That would be part of the agenda policy. setting. So Not policy? policy? No. No, it would be as Julie and I are oh, setting oh, the agenda, got it, got it, got it. we will okay. move things around. Got it. And so, so can we uh, all have access to sort of make suggestions or whatever in the document? You, you, yeah, you do. You do. Yeah. We do. So all you have to do is go up um, up to the top corner where the little pencil is. Oh, I could I could do it. And, and Dylan just, taught me. And just switch it to suggestions yeah, so then Dylan. that way people can see what was there. Okay. Um, and I just highlighted, if Kelly, if you could scroll up. There. Yeah. See, I just highlighted the two things, and I it didn't get them. Right, and I just took out the director of facilities and Harriman from okay. tonight. Is there a way on Google Docs to distinguish who puts what in there? Yes, like, there's a history a version. Version. So okay. you can see who did what and changed. Okay. Um, to Julie's point, if you use the pencil, it puts your name next to who added oh. or commented. 
No hiding in Google. Like if I say, let me see if I can do it real quick and it'll show up there. Um, I can say. And, and I was just looking, yeah. So but then instead so of it saying, if I'm I, saying, don't call it facilities, call it planning. And you can hover over it and it'll, it'll show. It'll say that it was you. Yeah, Cal, okay. can you hover over me? Or see how I'm sticking on the side there? Yeah. Um, and then, well, we can figure this out. But I think it's important, too, that um, if people are adding to that list of what is a good idea for a workshop and other people have the same idea, like, you need, I think there needs to be a way to say, like, yeah, I would add that too. So like that's now two people who want, you know, who are interested in that. Or that's now three people who are interested adding, in that. I think adding a comment um, next okay. to it would work. Because again, mm -hmm. it's going to tag people and it's showing yep. an additional folks. You can also make a comment under somebody's additions. So you can tag uh, it to say yes or, mm -hmm. you know, that's something I'd love to see oh, soon. Maybe don't say yes because that could seem like you're voting. Say, I, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe just say. That's I agree. a great idea. <laughs> but no, love, love this idea. <laughs> you're right. Be careful that you're not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's ways within the sharing that you can actually do all of those things that you're suggesting. Okay. Okay. All right. Moving on. Um, 6.0. Amy, I'm turning this to you. Community dialogues and forums. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, begin our conversation about what that might look like in terms of if, if we wanted to um, do some outreach with the community in a face-to-face -face setting, um, how, how might that work? And um, similarly to getting the teachers here tonight and continuing um, to do that more as we move forward, would it be a really good opportunity for us to start thinking about setting up some events where either we as a full board or we could, you know, divide and conquer it. Like where, how can we provide an opportunity for the, the community to come together and, and meet with us? Um, I know that we, we did that in years past. Um, I think, I think if Julie, I think you guys have also done some events like mm -hmm. that. Yep. Um, so I just wondered if, if we could talk about that as a board and see if it's a good idea and maybe uh, make a goal to maybe do um, one a quarter. I'd like to check so, in with communication. Yeah, I was just going to say, we can absolutely have that conversation, but yeah. this is actually what we're currently doing Perfect. in communications. Awesome. Um, we and we're actually, so we've talked a lot about that, what events can we have, what kind of forums can we have, and then um, we're actually meeting, I mean, this is now kind of turning into a committee report, but we're actually meeting jointly with the town council communications mm -hmm. committee to see if we can do some stuff um, together with them. And um, On February and then we'll bring, 11th? On February 11th. And then we'll bring that back to awesome. you guys once we have like kind of a more concrete plan. But we can absolutely, I mean, if you guys have ideas, you can, we can absolutely have that conversation now also. I don't, I, go, go ahead. ahead. I just have one procedural question. So if this is a public mm -hmm. event and it's advertised, can we all go? Yes. Yes. Okay. You just can't take any action. Yep. Right. Right. Yep. Got so, it. I would add three things to that. One, um, in terms of the community dialogue, as you all have probably experienced, per policy, that occurs every 18 months, which would mean that we would be doing one in the spring. Um, given that you're currently searching for a new superintendent, my recommendation would be to do that in the fall when you have a new superintendent. I know for myself, it was very powerful um, for me to be able to have that opportunity to engage with our community. Um, we can certainly have one. Um, but I think part two or number two that between the budget and all of the different outreach efforts with the budget that we are going to be engaging in and um, I don't know if I should be assuming this but assuming that you're going to engage the community in a variety of forums through the search process mm -hmm. that's a really busy mm -hmm. spring um, and that's a lot of asking a lot of the community to give their time so that would just be something I would suggest keeping um, top of mind. And then one other thing that I shared with both the communications committee and the town manager um, is a, a solution that I learned about at the conference I was at last week. <coughs> it's called Thought Exchange. It's an electronic way to engage the community. And so you could put a question out there such as, what are, you, what are this, you know, the skills and attributes we're looking for in our next school mm -hmm. superintendent? And you just put it out to the community. They access it through either like a QR code or a link. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of ways we could communicate that through the leader, through newsletters, through the website. 
Um, and then they can go on and actually post a comment. So maybe they say, um, well, she'd be 5'4 and have blue eyes and be a lot like Julie. Um, and then people would rate that, one star to five stars. She's trying to be funny. Um, <laughs> that's not what anyone would say. Um, but then what it does is it literally creates a sociogram, which is like a social network analysis, and it takes comments and it pulls like comments together so that you can start to see like where are the clusters in our community you know is is that one person who said that five four blue eyes thing like the outlier way over here um, or is there a lot of people saying that um, you know and and it's a way it's another way for us to just be accessible mm -hmm. and it's is engaging as social media um, it's as effective as having a public meeting but it doesn't require that face-to-face Time. Not saying that you would do this instead of. Um, it's a pricey tool, but I think there's a lot of opportunity as a shared resource between the town and the schools. And this is kind of, it's building this network here as I'm talking to you um, as a model. You guys can see it too. But if you just went on Thought Exchange, you could look at it. I'm not promoting it in any sort of way. I just knew that this was a topic that was important on both the school and town side. And so when I saw this product, I made a point to spend time with them and learn a lot about it. What I found fascinating was that superintendents um, in districts much larger, larger than ours said they would, um, they do a lot of surveys, they survey their communities a lot, there's lots of survey saturation. It's difficult to create an unbiased survey um, without seeking some sort of third party person and then it's who analyzes the data, mm -hmm. again, um, you know, in a community like ours where there's low levels of trust, I think that that would there's always questions of like, well, who, who analyzed that data and can I get the raw data? Um, and so they're working for you on the backside doing those things. And so I think that kind of takes that off the table. But what I found fascinating was that um, it was almost, almost 10 times more, in, more engagement using a tool like this than a survey and certainly than you know, some sort of public meeting because you see what happens. We plan these great events and then you know, few people show up because everyone's so busy. This, I did it right from my phone. Um, what they did was it wasn't instead of having dialogue face to face, but it was to prepare for a more productive dialogue. So the first day we logged on, it literally took like two minutes for 80 superintendents to put in their thoughts. And then I rated like 30 different thoughts in a minute, maybe 90 seconds. Um, and then the next day they broke us into 10 different drill down groups based on the, the themes. So I attended the, the drill down discussion around um, increasing social, emotional, and mental health needs in our schools. And had an amazing, rich discussion with nine or 10 other superintendents from around the country who also are grappling with that. So um, it was quick, it was easy. Like I said, it's, it's, a not, it's not free, um, but I think it's worth at least if the board is interested or if the council together, if, if it's something that you all think might help the community, um, they're more than willing to do a face, um, like a go to meeting or um, something like that. What I learned in talking with the town manager is that we already have access to another tool, horrible name in my opinion, it's called Bang the Table. <laughs> Not that that's influencing my <laughs> thoughts of its effectiveness, but this is something that we're using through the comp planning. And so we purchased a piece of it and have, I think, 18 months to use that just through the comp planning. But um, we're also looking at, you know, is it worth our time to explore that tool and learn more about that tool and maybe a couple others? In addition to having the forums, I don't think it's this instead of. I think it's just another way to engage the community. And the engagement numbers were shocking. They really were. And I could give you a couple other examples of folks that I talked to who use the product if you're interested. So I just wanted to put those things out there. And, and I think, I mean, I think it's great. I think it totally makes sense that the committee and the commun uh, communication and outreach group is working on that. I just wanted us to publicly acknowledge that that's a goal of ours yes, in yes. terms of uh, being able to provide those opportunities to come together as a community and have discussions. So, yeah. great. And I think, too, one of the things, like, I think you just said it. One of the things is that... Um, taking into consideration that saturation, like right now there's gonna be a lot of budget work, so some of the stuff that we're planning on for the future that isn't budget related might come a little bit later okay. so that we're not confusing the issues. Okay. Yeah, I agree. 
Julie's point is well taken. We're, we have a lot going on in the next couple of months. One, one other thing that I wanted to bring to this conversation that resonated with me from our workshop today is how we approach the community um, outreach. We, it shouldn't come from us out. Um, I think we really need to get a sense of what the stakeholders want so that we're not trying to create something that yeah. turns out to not be a good fit or something that they're not interested in. Right. Um, and so that will definitely be something we talk about, you know, um, with our communications and um, yeah. town council. Mm -hmm. Thank Great. you guys for taking that on. Um, 7.0, school board retreat focused on discussing norms. I know we need to schedule one of those. Um, Again, looking at, short of looking at the calendars, um, we do need to get that in place. I don't know what folks' availability is. Um, I don't know if doing something similar to tonight, like at a 4.30 to you know, 7 beforehand, is enough time to get into this, if it needs to be longer. Um, if it is longer, how we balance that in to have um, max involvement so I think that's just an open conversation to be had can we do what what's that thing called do um do the whole work a doodle, doodle, doodle. doodle. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we absolutely for availability that. I think mm -hmm. that's like the easiest way to do it yeah. okay can, can and then we I think one of the off like on a weekend too the, well I mean typically we originally isn't talked about yeah. doing typically it typically like isn't it like Saturday. off site somewhere mm -hmm. like it's mm -hmm. not usually yeah it just so needs to, to be everybody. public yes right yeah it's with notice Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. I just, it's not like this sitting at a table, like right. <laughs> sitting in chambers. Like, yeah, no. Oh, it's, <laughs> it needs to be someplace that's comfortable it's enough to <coughs> get the work done. Right. Um, generally, not having it so formal mm -hmm. because you lose a lot of the creativity. Right. Um, but yes, I can put the doodle pull together. Great. I will be straight and honest that I am like MIA for the, until like February 23rd. Um, um, well, can I we we'll can we then. agree on a date that we want to get it done by, so that the doodle poll isn't like when's your availability from now until June? I mean, yeah. you know what I mean, like. And I could make a recommendation. Are mm -hmm. you thinking of using MSMA? Um, I haven't discussed that part yet. Okay, just because we, we were talking with them, and they are doing several superintendent searches, and um, it sounded like scheduling was a challenge. You might, if that's who you want to use, you might try to get availability from them first, and then. About the doodle poll. So you're not doing the doodle poll, and then they're like, "Well, we're not available until March 23rd." Yeah. Well, let's see what their what their okay, availability is. I, I would hate for them to limit us or mm -hmm. not get it done because they're mm -hmm. not available. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we might want to think about it the other way around. Is to your point, when do we want to do it? Because there are other mm -hmm. facilitators that we could leverage mm -hmm. uh, internally. So to me, it seems like an important thing to get done if we're establishing our goals. So I'd mm -hmm. want to do it sooner rather than later. So if you're like, I was going to say end of February, but that seems unrealistic. Maybe well, mid-March. Yeah. And that's really just more because of... And the Ides of March. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Let's say Sport-wise. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it? What time? By the end of March? Yep. <laughs> that worked? We're listening yeah. to okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I think we can be flexible as far as okay. who does the facilitation. I do believe that a facilitator is incredibly important because yeah. it is almost impossible to participate and facilitate without coming across like a dictator. Yeah. And we know how well I do with that. Um, <laughs> so, we're just going to be clear. Julie, you mentioned that Monique does a really good job. She does. Um, mm -hmm. We also, Susan Godin, who we used this summer with um, our K-12 PD redesign could mm -hmm. be a good option. Sure. I mean, I, I think we could yeah. find it. I sure. didn't know if you were open beyond MSM. So yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It shouldn't be hard. We can find um, I think it would also be good to maybe to have somebody different mm -hmm. because agree. of the engagement that we're going to have with MSMA That's between point. now and yeah. June. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be helpful to have spoiler. another one. Yes. Um, a little bit of a spoiler. All right. Okay. So Doodle Poll will come out. We'll work on um, if okay. Julia Jai. Joanne, if either of you could send who is available or who you would recommend, and then mm -hmm. we can work on dates with them. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. New business. Um, 8.1, approval of a $500 donation from the Loyal Order of the Moose Lodge, 1310. Yes, yeah, so I would like um, to request a motion to approve this generous donation that we received. Um, 
it's by the loyal order of the Moose Lodge, as you said, for our school nutrition program. Um, my understanding is that each year they make some sort of donation to the schools. I think it's been to individual schools in, in the past, but this one is specifically to our school nutrition program. Um, so the Lodge offers uh, officers have made this donation with the suggestion that we use the funds to cover any deficit balances in student meal accounts. This is the second or third time that we've had a donation for that purpose, which is really great. Um, yeah, oh, Kate writes it right here in the memo. Similarly, the $366 donation we received back on December 20th from um, Strategic Media, and at that time, the CEO did not want to be recognized, so we're not recognizing him. That's not what I just did. Um, but we're grateful for his thinking of us and also for the loyal loyal order of Moose Lodge, number 1310, for thinking up as well. So we respect, respectfully request that the school board approve to accept the donation from the Moose Lodge with our thanks. I move to so accept this gracious donation. Second. Any discussion? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for this incredibly generous donation. Absolutely. All those in favor? It is unanimous. Seven and two. Um, 8.2, approval of the consulting firm to assist with the superintendent search. Um, just as background for the community, um, we did talk with three different firms. Um, one was in Nebraska, one is in New England, and then the Maine School Management Association. We invited one in to do a presentation for us. Um, and as we went through the presentation, I think there was a great level of confidence in I'm looking at Nick and Sarah to pipe in as I speak. Um, one of the greatest things that came to me with this was our ability to pick and choose what they were going to do to support us in the search process. Um, majority of the firms, it is here are our packages, whether or not you take advantage of everything. And it can get incredibly pricey as they start bundling things together. And of course, it's much like a cable, the channel you really want, Nesson, is <laughs> going to be on the most expensive one. Um, same sort of thing happens here. Others, it was, you tell us what you want us to do and we'll price it. Well, we haven't done this as a board, so we may not know what pieces we need and we didn't want to miss anything. Um, MSMA has been incredibly gracious and helpful and supportive the whole way through this process. Um, and I am so appreciative for everything that they have done with us. Um, so I am, um, actually, I'll let you guys talk before yeah, I keep going. The thing I would add to that is that they, they were very exuberant in their excitement around doing the ser uh, search with us and working with us. Um, they're a local outfit. They're, they've been doing uh, searches now more, um, more numerously over the past several years. They're very uh, excited to take this on. So it's always, it's always nice to see a contractor who's excited to be in a new, uh, relatively new line of work, but they still have a very large breadth of experience, so it's a good sweet spot. I think it's going to be a good fit for Scarborough because they know us well, and, and just to be completely transparent, they know our recent history well, and um, I, I think it's a very good fit, and I'm excited to see them so excited to work with us. Yeah. Uh, not much to add other than it feels like a true partnership instead yeah. of like a contractor, and I think it was one of the first times we all kind of came together and were <laughs> all equally as excited about it, so it's a positive step. Um, and then just as a little more clarification, we had an opportunity today to meet with Kate Bolton and look at the finances, and we can absorb this um, through, and I just blanked on the, if there's a funding um, line that has room in this because we received a grant for another um, professional service. Strategic planning. Thank you, strategic planning. We received a grant, so there is money to absorb this without impacting any other line items. So that was a great confidence boost as well that we can do this work. Um, so with that, I would ask for um, a motion to allow us to enter into contract with MSMA. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Did we get the final number on that? Um, we did, and I had actually sent that email out to everybody. That hasn't changed, though. That has not changed. Okay. Um, the only piece that they did put into the note on there is that it's based on 20 applicants. If it goes up, it could go a little higher. They also did not provide any estimates for um, travel expenses, which is something as we bring people into district or we choose to go visit somebody's district, 
because we don't know locations, we can't estimate what that cost might be. Um, so that is a variable that we don't have at this time. Less than 20 applicants, will it reduce the cost? Yes. Okay. And I assume because it's like an a la carte type menu that if we choose <laughs> to take advantage of more that more services um, then that that cost would go up also correct um, there are pieces that we can actually it says right here in the letter that I would need to sign yeah, tissue please um, I get all, ex all excited uh, we can purchase additional items <laughs> at the rate of $158 per hour um, so there is an opportunity if we need more that they can provide additional support. Well, we'll also be able to save some of that money on the other side some places because there's some skills we have as we've already discovered in some of our initial designs and some of the materials that typically they would bill out that we're going to be able to do in-house. So I think between the give and the take, I think their estimate's a pretty reasonable number. I do um, too. And pretty, yeah. It would now be a good time to talk about some of the services they're going to provide so the community, community can sure. do that? Absolutely. Um, we absolutely can do that. We are looking at um, creating a form so that we would actually have the community involved and staff. There will be two separate forms. Um, so there's, that's a good chunk of the costing um, is getting ready for the form, putting out surveys, um, and then actually conducting each of those forms. They'll be doing some custom application materials. Um, they are responsible for all correspondence with the candidates, which is awesome. That takes all of the stress off of us. Um, so if there's somebody who right off the bat, you know, they didn't fill out their documents or they don't have the qualifications, we're not the ones who have to send that rejection messaging. Um, they will do a bro brochure circulation and after the vote we're going to take a look at the incredible brochure that has been created, um, which again saved big money for mm -hmm. the community. Um, doing a web page, doing redaction of the applications. They will also be doing committee workshops. As we go out and we reach out to the community and we have folks involved in the process, they're going to do workshops explaining um, what sort of rules and regulations come into play. There's some privacy rules that are in there. Um, there's some confidentiality commenting. So they will make sure that everybody who is involved is covered and prepared. Um, they will also do interview questions and a scoring rubric so that the questions, we don't have to come up with them. They're going to be uniform questions. Um, we'll probably have input into how those are laid out, um, but it will ensure that we're asking each candidate the same questions so that it's a fair assessment. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I talked a lot tonight. All right. Another nice thing about what they're doing is that they're focusing their recruitment regionally, but they're also really pushing hard the networking in Maine, working with the districts that we have, communicating through multiple different channels. And I think that's important as we think about the, the nature of our search. Everyone is expressing interest in really focusing and having a, a, a welcoming main applicants and I like that MSMA is so focused on that and why wouldn't they be? So that's great. Yeah, I agree. Okay. You ready for vote? All those in favor? Okay. Right. Unanimous, seven and two. Thank you. Um, I'll be signing this and letting them know tonight that you were able to enter into the agreement. Um, I would like to bring up I'm going to try to show the um, brochure. Have you explained yet who developed it and why we're saving money? No. I figured we'd go in as we brought this up. Okay. Just want to make sure. I think it's looking for me. Maybe. Maybe not. Absolutely not. You can have it. Um, while it's being brought up, I don't know if it was Sarah who did this or a friend of Sarah's. Very good delegator. Okay. Good. <laughs> friend um, of mine. <laughs> which, huge thank yous to yes. the person who did this. Um, again, this was hundreds of dollars that this saved the community in an expense. Um, but this would be a brochure that would be sent out um, via mail to different school er districts um, within the state as well as going out um, regionally, so people will have a hard copy of this. This is MSMA, is 
that makes yes. sense. Yes, yes, they will do this work. Um, so, Mia, just to clarify, we don't necessarily need to vote on this, but no. this would be the last round of feedback. So what you guys, what you'll see is this is the second iteration. So she sent me an original, I, I feed that back, and then uh, Nick and Leanne gave a round of feedback as well. So hopefully it's relatively good to go, unless we want to change some pictures or some of the content. Um, and if so, we can get, I'll get that off to her tonight or tomorrow, and we'll have a final copy next week. Great. Um, but, yeah, no, we could not do... Um, you know, while we did share this um, over the share drives, we really couldn't communicate it other than publicly, which is why it's coming up. It does not, to Sarah's point, require any voting, um, but we do want to make sure that the feedback is public. Turn up this is the right email address to get it the old. Yeah, no, that no, wouldn't be the one. the old one, yeah. <laughs> Scroll it's, down. If you go into... You um, it's into the... Oh, I got it. Can you scroll down to the, the, the content? Thank you. Content on the bottom. Um, sure. Julie, if you can scroll down to the bottom. Thank you. Oh, sorry. We're going to have the actual deadline on there, though, right? Yes. Okay. That's actually one thing that we should figure out before I have her do the final copy. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have been able to do that until after the vote. Yeah. So that we can get back to MSMA, and then they will work through the timeline to provide that deadline to us. Julie, what is the in parentheses the state superintendent that first line? Is that your certification? Okay. Is that O one O or zero one O? Yeah, so that should be a zero and a zero one zero all numbers. Yeah, that's not a yeah. I noticed that too. It looks kind of like a face. Yeah, I think that says. Are we doing anything out of like gratitude oh, for this? Oh, Are we giving her anything or our thanks? Our thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get her something personally. Yeah. I owe her a house for this. Hundreds. So the educational philosophy piece. Is that where did that language come from? Uh, it came from. I think from the website. The what? Yeah. The, the school, school website. School yeah. website. Oh. I think like the formatting and the look of it is like spot on. I might I would just change some of the pictures. I think. Yeah, I agree. So I don't I don't love the map. I don't love the map, and I don't love the marsh. I um, love the map. Oh, see, I love the map. Me too. Oh, that's I, okay. I love it because if you're <laughs> if you're not from Maine, I think that that something similar. Would, would Some people really hear me and then there was another like map. Yeah. Or there was another map that we threw out that was a little <laughs> too geographical. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of that. So maybe some other, like, instead of the map, or how would you change the map would yeah. be good feedback? Yeah. How would a map? I mean, I isn't there, map. like, in the, um, like what, the it, in information what about Maine, can't we just say uh, two hours from Boston? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, we could do that. It's Honestly, a good visual. Sarah, I just think that on the educational philosophy, if that could be just a little bigger. Okay. The text. The text, the uh, bottom. The very bottom. Educational philosophy, it, and it doesn't look like it's the same font, but I could be wrong, it's just as the buff. I agree. I as think it's book. italics. It, yeah. It's just italics. italics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I don't know if it's the same font. I I really, check is it just it is. the first part, our educational philosophy? Like the first paragraph? I actually don't know. It's on the bottom of our website. You actually it's have an educational philosophy policy. I know, and it's well, not from is, there because I double checked. Yeah, it. it's not for the policy. It's actually on the school website. website yeah. on the bottom. Probably like on the superintendent page, it just says like general stuff about the district. Yeah. So maybe yeah. you actually have a No, this was it's the first part of it was pulled from the example that uh, MSMA originally did, like the draft that they did, and then the second paragraph was pulled from the website. But like in our newsletter, when we do our educational philosophy at the top, isn't that it? Oh, our mission. We do our mission. I, I wondered if it made sense to put our mission. Mission instead of the, yeah. What do you guys think? I'm good with either one. I like mission. You mean to replace okay. the first blurb with the mission? Yeah. That could work. Yes. And I, I also like the listing of the, the, the four um, values. 
but yes. I'm probably not room for it. But I really like the. What's that? Yes. Like so, if we, could, if we had room for the mission and then those four points. Yeah. Well, that, that would you that could out. do that. I think if you took that out, took out the text that's there now and shifted that. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that would work. Yeah. Um, but I agree with the comments about the photos that I would like to see more student-based photos. Um, whether it's you know ones from the budget um, workbook that we had, I sent over a couple um, to you as well. I don't know if that's okay. So, like so we have so we have limited space, right? So we have yeah. to make, we have to make some choices. I think the directive, which you guys can tell me if you agree with, was the things that make Scarborough so great is the landscape, hence the the marsh or picture. Maybe we sub out the marsh for a picture of the beach. Um, the uh, geographical location, proximity to Boston, on the coast, whatever. And then obviously a picture of our school or our students. Um, so I think, you know, there's two pictures of the marsh. Maybe we sub one of those for like an athletics photo. I agree with Sarah keep, to keep in mind that we were part of the reasoning behind these pictures was to sell the lifestyle here yeah. too, mm -hmm. not just to sell the school. Right. That's a good point. I like the canoe picture. I think the other marsh picture would be put in something with kids, okay. something um, with athletics, or uh, that that would that would fit it. If anybody has one of like the younger students, Kate does oh, in the budget book. book. Okay, from actually, last year, and we have, and, share, okay. and um, <laughs> we all have we already have permissions to use that Perfect. those pictures. Do you guys remember a picture where they took, like, they were standing on a ladder and they took like the entire eight corners school? Mm -hmm. From above, in front of the entire school population, in front of the school. Like, that would be a cool picture. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Doing something. Okay, I'll reach out to Kate. Julie, where's the shared folder that all the pictures from the district go in? It's in there somewhere. Is that a folder? I'll get it from Kate. Is that a folder? I have cute kids. Just huh? throw them out in the yard. Very used to it. Okay, anything else? So the, the things that I've... So 010 needs to change to zero. The text on the educational philosophy. Um, check the font, but also replace the first blurb with the mission, potentially four values if mm -hmm. we have room. Yeah. Um, swap out the second marsh photo for a student-based photo. Are we okay with the map? Yes, I like maps. Yeah, sure. The map is fine. I just don't like it. I don't want to drink the market. <laughs> I like You're on record for not liking <laughs> Thank you. It. I like the visuals. I have a logistical question. Are, you, are they not applying for frontline zone? Like, this has no. no. being like paper mail. No, there, it's, um, MSMA has their own system. It's okay. going right. It's probably. And it's going right to them. Really? How do you feel about that? Like, you can't apply online? You can, I don't you can know. Email us. You know I have a problem with this. <laughs> I mean, there will be a website that they people yes. can apply through. No, they, we're going to use multiple ways to, yeah. okay. to get yeah. the yeah. information. Well, we have the website before yeah, this like, goes to right. print. Yes. Oh, we will? That's okay. something that they will create for us. Okay. Okay. So then, mm -hmm. that this is what's yeah. What's that? Yeah. You need that yeah. Correct. <laughs> Sometimes they want to see how they package their materials, too. Well, and remember, this is a physical flyer that's going to go out, so this may be more focused on the physical applicant. I think the online recruiting tactic will be separate from this. Correct me if I'm wrong? Yes, I think you're dead on. I think this gets emailed. No. This is being mailed out. This is, this is a physical piece. Oh. And it is going to be posted, like, on boards in different schools. Yeah. But we need the link for the website so that those who are like Julie, that want to <laughs> apply online, will have the link, right? I mean. <laughs> See, the, the examples they provided did not have, did, don't know have URLs on them. No. Not for applying. They have like a link to the school website. They have a link to, as we do, to their email and the physical address. But this is, I think this is really designed to target people who are going to apply either in, per, well, through paper yeah yeah so that's why or I think it may drive somebody right. to go and look um, yeah. on a job on hosting schools or the yes. other mm -hmm. I also think from a, from a timing standpoint because this is a very tight process 
getting this physical piece out before the website is finalized and the URL is created is critical. I think if we were to wait for a URL, then this piece would be too late to be effective as a recruitment tactic. Okay. That's just my thought. Well, this one Anyone who's interested in this is going to go to our district web page. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is to me the first thing they do is Google. Where are you going to actually post the job? Because anyone who's looking for a job is going to be on Surrey School. That's, we're doing that. Yes, that's, that. yes yeah. it'll be out there. So it's all electronic. Yes. 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 It's, it's going to be on there as well. This is this is just, just the first, another piece. first step. It's a teaser. It's, it's definitely a teaser. It's a teaser. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So we made a lot of comments, but I just want to like reiterate though that this is it's really awesome. good. It's yes. amazing. I think yeah. it's a really yeah. It's a it's really fabulous. Um, it saved them for like a thousand dollars. I it saved a lot of money, and it's, money and and not just that. It actually, I mean, it looks great. It, it does look good. It's amazing. It's a, and if you want donations from anybody, let me know because I'm happy to pitch in on this housewarming <laughs> gift you buy because of the work that was done. I mean, this yeah. is incredible. Ditto. Thanks. I'll pass it on. And she's available for extra work. <laughs> she also did all of my campaign signs, which clearly were effective. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is this Thank is you, amazing. Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, 8.3, the appointment of the high school indoor track coach. Yeah, this is more of an FYI. As you all know, you don't technically have to approve these things, but in past boards have. Um, so the motion would be to approve two um, co-advisors for Storm for a Cure, um, Yvette Barone and Toby Walsh. They're both volunteering, so there's no cost to the district for their work, um, but this is something that I know our students and our staff get really passionate about every year. We've raised thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars um, through Storm for a Cure, so. Oh, oh, it doesn't match. We're talking high, school school indoor track track. high school indoor track coach. Okay. Do we need these approved as well? Okay. Um, I don't think we have it. I thought that sounded So familiar. the motion is to approve um, a high school, in, indoor, high school indoor track coach, pole vaulting coach. Do we have the person's name? I do. Hold on. And that's booster funded. Booster funded? It is booster funded. Which is booster funded. Josh Again, Williams. Again, Joshua Gelfand. Joshua. I don't know. As Dylan, as stated by Dylan. <laughs> Dylan knows lots. There it is. Is there a motion? Yeah. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Passes. Seven and two. Okay. Okay. Um. A little bit later than I had gunned for, but can I have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Excellent. We're going to count those both as a first and a second. All those in favor? Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.